bada bing, bada bam, bit. <laughs> welcome, welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. I'm so. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Do you want to do your one part? <laughs> a bada bing, bada bam. He's so proud of that part, okay? So, welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. I'm so freaking excited because today we're doing a book bam. We're doing a full on crazy thriller book bam and. It's a different setting because we are in our apartment in New York City and I'm so freaking excited. Don't stress, we're still going back and forth from Atlanta, but look at it. Look at it. This is what I did in like 24 hours. <laughs> so with that being said, let's get into the baking. Let's get into the story because this is going to be a long one. It's going to be a doozy. And today we are baking, I don't know the word for this. It's, it's a Chinese recipe or at least we found it on like a Chinese website. They call it toasty milk. Okay, we're making toasty milk. I'm just gonna trust you with this. Okay, we're making toasty milk. I was in a thriller hump, a thriller speed bump, if you will. I felt like nothing was scratching my itch. Even the last book bam that we did, it just did not do it for me. The ending was rushed, it didn't feel complete, but this book that we're talking about today, I fell in love with this book. It is one of the best books I've read this entire year and it's freaking September. So that's a long time. I freaking love Alice Feeney. I love her work. She's the queen of twists. So the book is called Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney, which she has so many good books, including her newest release that I'm listening to on Audible called Daisy Darker. Every single word that she writes, I just straight up want to binge it. And you can go listen to all of her audiobooks on Audible. Listen, listen. And listen, judging by these videos, I'm sure you guys can tell I'm obsessed with audiobooks. I had a goal at the beginning of this year to listen to two to three audiobooks a week, and I think this is the first time in freaking New Year's resolution history that I have lasted this long with my New Year's resolution. Audible has just made it that much easier. I can listen on the go. I can listen when I'm in New York City, Atlanta, sipping on my coffee, watching the sunset, driving, doing dishes, in the shower. It is so easy to pick up where I left off, and with Audible's incredible selection of audio audiobooks, it's a dream to just get lost in their catalog. Audible has audiobooks from bestsellers to new releases to celebrity memoirs, or my favorite, you guys know, mysteries, thrillers, are you kidding? My fiance's favorite, wellness, business, self-help. We're very different. You can find Audible originals that you can't find anywhere else. They're from top celebrities, renowned experts, and new voices in audio. But my favorite part is that as an Audible member, I can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. I mean, this month I used it on Daisy Darker, Alice Feeney's newest audiobook. I'm already just so hooked. It's about a woman named Daisy and her whole family, the Darker family. They're assembling together on a private island for their Nana's 80th birthday party. So each family member comes to this secluded, creepy, unsettling island with their own little dark secrets because this is not a wholesome family moment. And at the stroke of midnight, clock strikes, the storm comes down, and Nana's dead. Then another follows. Okay, I know what you're thinking. It's a nod to Agatha Christie's Then There Were None, which I normally don't love like these nods to the classic thrillers because the classics are classic for a reason. Alice Feeney has a way of doing such unpredictable things all the time. I can't even, I think I'm like maybe 25% through. I can't stop listening. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts that you can download or stream all you want. So make sure to go check out Audible linked in the description and right now, new members can try Audible for free for 30 days if you just visit audible.com slash BAM or text BAM to 500-500. That's audible.com slash BAM or text BAM to 500-500. Thank you, Audible, for sponsoring this week's episode, and let's get into it. So the book is primarily written in three POVs. You have the husband, which is Adam Wright, and then the wife, Amelia Wright, and the person that's messing with them. Yeah, it gets crazy. We also see the wife's letters that are scattered throughout the book. It's a lot, but I think the writing style is just really unique in the sense that a lot of books do these constant back and forths from the husband to the wife's POV, and usually I hate it because I feel like I'm reliving the same event twice, but, oh, so good, so necessary. So with that being said, may I introduce you to Amelia Wright in February of 2020. She starts off with the very explosive sentence, my husband doesn't recognize my face. In fact, he can't recognize anyone's face. 
he has face blindness, officially called prosopagnosia. So anytime he looks at anyone, their faces blend and morph into one of those twisted Van Gogh paintings. He can't even read people's facial expressions. So he can read people's body language, but if you look upset, it doesn't register if just your face is showing. So it's a real medical condition? It is, yeah. It's, wow. I actually read an article about this before I picked up this book, having no idea that this book was about that. It's crazy. They said it's like staring into a bowl of mashed potatoes. Wow. Yeah. Even when he looks into the mirror, he can't see his own face. So if he what? sees a picture of himself, he can't really recognize as himself. It's a cognitive thing. I mean, imagine that. So she's driving, her husband is next to her, but is he even really looking at her? What does he even see? She says that there's so many times that Adam has walked straight past her on the street without even recognizing her, without even saying hi, or sometimes when they would go to dinner, he wouldn't know where she was sitting. So sometimes he would sit at the wrong table. And for that reason, you know, he never liked the idea of having kids. He said that he just can't imagine the thought of not recognizing their faces ever. But there are other ways that he can recognize people, even his wife Amelia. You know, he knows her smell better than anyone else. He knows the sound of her voice, the ridges on her hands. Well, at least when he used to hold it. He doesn't really hold it anymore. So Amelia's gotten used to it, but it's still fascinating to her that the man that she married would never be able to put her in a police lineup. Like, that's strange. Just think about it. But it's not as strange as the journey that they're on. And I don't mean in the metaphorical sense, like, the journey of marriage. No, I'm talking the actual journey from London to a random tiny little village in Scotland. It was supposed to be a scenic, almost like a marriage counseling trip had they checked the weather before taking off. Amelia is actually gripping the handle of her steering wheel so tight that her knuckles are just pure white. She's losing the blood circulation in her fingers. The weather warrants it. It's snowing so hard. It's like driving on a marshmallow, but it's not fun. The windscreen wipers are struggling to keep up with the mounting snow, and it doesn't help that Amelia's car is from the 70s. Amelia likes it vintage, what can you say? But she can't help that, okay? Her husband wants to trade her and her old car in for a younger model. That's what she's thinking when she's driving. What kind of husband, you know? What kind of husband wouldn't want that? She thought to herself. Besides, he seems really annoyed. It was supposed to be an eight hour road trip and now it's taking even longer. And it's it's not even cute, it's a very tense road trip. Adam hates car rides. He doesn't even have his own car. He doesn't have a license. He refuses to sit in the driver's seat of a car. And add to that, the only reason they're even going on this trip to begin with is because their marriage counselor told them that it would, dun dun dun, save their marriage. It's technically their last chance to fix things. And it's not off to a bang. Adam is complaining the whole time. He would rather be at home, shut away in his office with his mounds of books. Okay, so a little bit about the couple. Adam Wright is a screenwriter. And uh, Mr. Wright, the screenwriter, kind of has a ring to it, right? When he was 16, he started working selling snacks at the movie theater. By 21, he sold the rights to his first screenplay called Rock, Paper, Scissors. But it never made it past development. The book wasn't a bestseller, but there was a short film version that won a BAFTA. That was like the kick of his career. That was the height, right? What's the name of this book? Rock, Paper, Scissors. Just you wait. See, I like this. Like, Me too. It's getting like confused. Yes. Is it real life? <laughs> Is this autobiography? So good. No, it's so good, okay? Now, screenwriters, they don't really get a lot of credit to normal people, but Amelia is willing to bet that we've all seen a film that he's worked on. Despite their marital problems, she's really proud of her husband. He can turn undiscovered books into blockbuster movies, and it's great. It pays for their fancy house in London, their old Victorian-style house, their trips, Amelia's expensive clothes and perfume, but it takes up all his time. And sometimes, Amelia does find herself getting a little bit jealous. She says, My husband doesn't cheat on me with other women or men. He has love affairs with their words. It's his whole life. And I'm going to be honest with you, he does kind of have a whole writer complex going on. He's like the tortured artist type where he's like, ugh. You're listening to Taylor Swift. I only listen to Beethoven. I don't know who's who's classy. I don't know. He's not one dimensional though, so don't worry. Like you're not gonna hate him. But it's kind of that vibe. I feel like he's the type that would freak out if he saw how much creamer I put into my coffee. That's the vibe that he gives. Meanwhile, Amelia doesn't really like working with people. Adam has to. She works at Battersea Dogs Home. Dogs are nicer. 
It's a rescue home where all the abused dogs are dropped off. So yeah, it's emotionally draining, but fulfilling. Dogs are just too good for all of us. They don't, they don't hold grudges. They don't, they don't hate people. I mean, it's not the only reason that she works there, but sometimes the dust of the memories are best left unswept. Bao, I'm gonna tell you something. I matched the whole theme of this video with these eggs. This shirt that I'm wearing, for these eggs. These are called Heirloom Blue Eggs. This is my favorite egg company. I've never Whoa. seen the blue version. The eggs. The egg is blue? Are blue. How is that possible? Okay, they look completely white on camera. Did so they dye it? Apparently, they don't dye it. It's a type of egg that has blue earlobes. It's Did a they? type of chicken and they just pop out blue eggs. And the bird of the month is named Topaz. Thanks for your baby, Topaz. R.I.P. So, you know, it's, it's kind of cute. There you have it. Adam, right, the fancy screenwriter. And then Amelia, right, his wife that works at a rescue home for dogs. Is this not the most perfect couple in Hollywood? I don't know what else to say. At least from the outside, it's a perfect couple. Both of them are really good at keeping up appearances. They're both very attractive. They almost always present themselves to the world as the happiest, cute little couple out there. And now the perfect couple are heading off into the beautiful Scottish Highlands. And it's normally super beautiful, but right now the wind is howling. It, the, it's trying to tumble the car off the road. It's getting icy. At one point, Amelia almost hits a deer and she screeches the brakes and panics to grab her inhaler. She's trembling as she shakes her inhaler and takes a couple of puffs. Adam is not so pleased. He never even wanted to be here in the first place. He's too busy to be here. Yeah, that's the word that their marriage is literally crumbling on. Busy. Amelia says Adam likes to feel important, you know? That he is too busy to do this, too busy to do that. It's almost like being busy makes him feel superior to everyone. And it makes her want to throw something at his face. And Amelia is like, yeah, well, we're here because you're too busy. That's the whole point. And just to show you how far gone their marriage is, Adam responds by saying this. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you suggesting it's my fault that we're in Scotland in February in the middle of a snowstorm? This was your idea, Amelia. At least I won't have to listen to your incessant nagging once we've been crushed to death by a falling tree or died from hypothermia and this shit. <laughs> so, of course it's her fault for trying to fix their marriage. And there he goes again, looking for his goddamn phone. Well, I asked you if you have everything that you needed when we left the house. I did, Amelia. I did have everything I needed. I put my phone in the glove compartment and now it's not there. If you put it in the glove compartment, it would still be there. It's not my job to pack things for you. I'm not your mother. Except Amelia knew exactly where his phone was. It was in the glove compartment till she took it out and brought it back home right before they left. There was no way they were going to spend this weekend away with Adam's eyeballs literally licking his phone screen. Absolutely not. So she bites her tongue, keeps on driving, and now the sun is setting. Soon, they're just gonna have to use the light of the moon to get to where they're headed, and they haven't seen another soul in forever. Not even a gas station. They're almost going on empty. Nothing but pure lakes and mountains for miles and miles. It's called the town of Blackwater. It sounds nice, right? But it suddenly seems spookier than picturesque. It, it makes sense that it's named Blackwater. All the lakes are black. And when they get to their romantic getaway, well, let's just say it's not any better. It's a large white building standing all alone in the snow. It's an old abandoned church, a chapel, if you will, called Blackwater Chapel. Adam is not pleased. He's like, we've driven all the way over here to stay in an old church. What? It's a converted chapel. And yes, but I did all the driving anyway. Amelia pulls up into the bridge before reaching the chapel and immediately they're staring into what looks like hundreds of eyes staring straight at them just in the freaking headlights. You're Amelia's frozen. Outside? Yeah. Sheep. <gasps> Lots of them. Damn. Huddled together, staring straight into the car. Amelia tries to inch forward. She honks her horn. She revs her engine. Nothing. They won't move. They're frozen. The sheep are staring. Bob, their dog, is in the back growling at the sheep. He's a big giant Labrador, okay? He's old, you know, he's, he's one of those dogs that he's a growler, but at the end of the day, he would befriend a robber. You just know it. He would befriend a sheep, a murderer, whatever it is. He would be their best friend in a second. He growls because he's scared. That's the type of dog that Bob is. The dog that's, that's scared of feathers. Just silly, silly things. 
So Adam gets out and shushes the herd away, opens the gate to the chapel, and gets back in the car. Now, they park near the front door of the chapel and they get out. It's freezing. They definitely were not built for this, okay? They didn't even wear the right clothes for this. I just imagined, just imagine like a Hollywood couple dressed in like fur and cute little Montclair outfits and they're at an African chapel where you need, you need some crazy gear. But the chapel seemed quirky, right? <laughs> they're trying to convince themselves but in the dark, with the whirring wind swirling around them, it felt more like an intro to a Catholic horror film, if I'm being honest. It's like, where are the ghost nuns? Come out, out. Ghost, ghost nuns. nuns. Anyway, their luck gets worse because the chapel doors are locked and Adam is confused. Did they say that there was a lockbox or something to find the key? Did the owners tell you where to find the key at least? No, they just said that the doors would be unlocked. The two of them think, okay, maybe the owners meant the back door. I mean, who keeps the front doors unlocked? So they walk to the back, passing by all the stained glass windows. And I'm sure in maybe like a spring, summery day, it would have been beautiful. But again, just seemed so spooky right now. They get to the back, no doors. They walk back to the front, freaking out. The snow is already piling on their car. They have no gas. Are they stranded? They're questioning all of this. Like, where are we going to sleep tonight? But when they get to the front, both of their mouths drop open. The doors of the chapel... The huge wooden doors that wouldn't budge, that were locked shut just two seconds ago, were now both wide open. Amelia? The doors were closed before, right? Yeah, but let's not jump to conclusions or anything. Oh yeah, that's not a conclusion at all. Doors don't just open by themselves, Amelia. Well, maybe the housekeeper heard us knocking? What website did you even book this place? It wasn't a website. I won the weekend away in the stuffed Christmas rifle at work, I told you. Okay, so you won a weekend away to stay in an old Scottish church in a staff raffle at your dog shelter home that you work at? <sighs> yeah, and it's a chapel, not a church. But what's wrong with that? People donate gifts every year, and I finally won something good for a change. Oh yeah, because this is good. It's good, Amelia. Really good. Will you do the honors? Me? Of course, yes, because if it gets too thick, it's not going to work. So all we did was stir it, simmer, like... Uh, not even a simmer, it was honestly three and seconds. Keep mixing it. And you're gonna get this really thick gelatin consistency. Put it into a glass container that you can oven bake and then throw it into the freezer. No, 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 no. no? no just a glass container. A small one though. I thought you have to oven bake it. No, you gotta take it out and then oh. bake. And? This is what it looks like. Adam is looking at his wife in disbelief because of course he is. Why is this a good idea? But now he has two options. Either he goes inside to the chapel and tries to see what to do, or he goes back into the car. And he said that he would rather eat his own organs than go back into the wife's car. So Adam starts unpacking the bags from the car. And he does it because he's a gentleman. But he also wants a moment of freaking peace before entering the chapel with his wife. And now we finally get a moment alone with Adam to hear about his face blindness. He hates telling people that he has it because, well, one of two things happens. Either they will automatically pity him or that's all they want to talk about from then on. And he's learning to live with it, but he's not okay with it. It poses a lot of stressful situations. Like one time, he couldn't recognize his wife in the crowd. He can't recognize his own face in the mirror. One time he went to a wedding and he didn't realize that he was talking to the bride and groom the whole time. The wife didn't want to wear a traditional wedding dress. <laughs> so it was, um, it was awkward, but thankfully Adam is very charming when he wants to be. Just not with his wife, apparently. Or at least not anymore. All she does is complain about how much he works and how he never has time for her. But not once, not once does he remember her complaining about the house that they live in, the fancy clothes that she buys, that all of his work pays for. Maybe the marriage is doomed because, I don't know, maybe both of them are broken. Adam's dad walked out on the family when he was still young. Adam's mom died when he was still in school. And Amelia was an orphan before she was even born, which just is another reason Amelia really loves her old car. It came from her dad. Not the car, but just the vintageness. Her dad was always into these old vehicles, never wanted a new car. Or at least that was what Amelia was told. But right before Amelia was born, her dad thought, maybe I need a new family car. We're gonna have a kid on the way. Yeah, I gotta buy a new car. So he bought the newest minivan. And when Amelia's mom went into labor, he was driving his brand new family car to the hospital and the brakes failed. They smashed into a truck. Amelia felt like newer doesn't always mean better. 
and the parents died instantly. A car stopped, a doctor was driving, and he was able to deliver Amelia on the side of the street. She was considered a miracle baby. And the doctor named her Amelia because he loved Amelia Earhart so much. <laughs> so From there, Amelia flew from foster home to foster home, and you know, they have no parents, no siblings, both of them, Adam and Amelia. And maybe that's why they have no kids. How can they be parents when they've never been par- when they've never had parents themselves? Besides, they have Bob. Bob is like their kid, their dog, yeah, the spoiled one. Maybe not right now, because he's growling and shivering in the snow outside the chapel with his tail down, but usually he's spoiled like a baby. Adam's like, it's okay, Bob, come on. And before Adam takes one step forward, he looks at his wife and says, you sure you want to do this? It's a loaded question. Do what? Fix the marriage? Enter the haunted chapel? Do what? Yeah, why not? I, I don't know, something just doesn't feel right. This isn't one of those horror movies written by one of your favorite authors, Adam. This is real life. Maybe the wind blew the doors open, okay? Sure. The wind blew the doors open. It was locked. They both knew it. So just like that, the couple and the dog step foot into the chapel. The floor looks ancient. The rest of the place looks rustic. That's how a realtor would describe it, you know? But it just means old, just antique. One wall is covered entirely in mirrors, small little mirrors, but the size of their palm. Cluttering the wall, odd gold framed mirrors, oval, square, rectangular, some without a distinct form, just these melting mirrors on the wall. They're hung on rusty nails, at least 50 mirrors, they think, makes Adam a bit dizzy. All the facial reflections of his face, sometimes he's glad he can't even see his own face because he's not sure that he would like what he saw. Then there were the skulls and the antlers of two stags mounted on the wall, taxidermied, like trophies. And instead of the eyes being kept, someone poked white feathers into it. It's creepy. Amelia was intrigued, but Adam, not so much. In fact, he found the whole antique looking church bench more fascinating than all of the mirrors and the stags on the wall. The church bench was just covered in dust, which means nobody's been here in a long time. That's not a good sign. <laughs> so Adam zones out thinking about his marriage to Amelia and you know, their marriage is dusty like the chair, it's symbolic. And Amelia comes up behind him and says, Adam, you don't need to draw in the dust to make a point. What? And he looks down and he sees a small smiley face on the bench in the dust. Did he do that? He hadn't what? noticed it before. Uh, oh, he can't recognize smiley face? He can, but he hadn't seen it. Uh. It's creepy. But before he can come up with a logical explanation, boom, the wooden chapel door slams shut and the couple spins around, but nobody's there. Just them and Bob, who's freaking terrified, like literally pissing on the floor. And Amelia's eyes are bulging out of her head. Amelia, you thought the wind might have blown the doors open. Maybe it blew it shut? Amelia nodded. And Adam tells us, the woman I married more than 10 years ago would have never believed that. But these days, my wife only hears what she wants to hear and sees what she wants to see. How can the wind close those, close those doors? So it's kind of like leaving that question of why is she so accepting of all these spooky little moments? Why is she just taking it for face value? Like, you're right, it's probably the wind. Ah. What? Say it! What do you think I'm gonna say? You're gonna say, like, it's not his wife. It is his wife. It is his wife. But she kind of set up some sh**. That's why she's trying to cover it up. So now we get to the point of the letters, which they're spaced out in the book. So they kind of break up the chapters between Adam and Amelia. And these letters were written every year of their anniversary. He hasn't even read them. They've been kept a secret all this time. And they all coincide with the gifts that you have to give on wedding anniversaries. Do you know what I'm talking about? The super traditional one. So the first wedding anniversary, you actually give the gift of paper. Paper? Like paper cash? <laughs> no, like a paper gift, like a letter or a card. Oh. It's just like one of those traditional things. But the first letter doesn't start with their first wedding anniversary. It starts with rock, which normally isn't the correct thing, but just like go with me. It all makes sense. October 2007. And I'm going to give you guys the gist of the letter, so go read them in length in the book because it's so good. But dear Adam, our first date was at the cinema. It wasn't really a first date. We both went to go see a movie alone and I accidentally sat on your chair and we joked around. We ended up leaving the movie together and I'm gonna be honest, everybody thought we were crazy. The relationship was so fast. It felt like a whirlwind. I mean, everyone said we wouldn't last. But look at us now, moving in together. It's a bit harder than I thought though. It's harder to hide the real dark sides from someone when you live with them. 
The whole house of yours is lined up with manuscripts and books. There's no place for me to put anything. I have to step sideways in the hallway to avoid stepping on more stacks of papers and stories. And I mean, I knew you were an aspiring author, an aspiring screenwriter, but I didn't know I was marrying a librarian. It's fine, though. The house is worn down, but I'm in love. And I've already accepted it's three of us. Forever. You, me, and your writing. Our first fight was probably the scariest, and it had nothing to do with writing. I was just looking at your desk, and I was looking for matches to light a candle. But I found your manuscript for rock, paper, scissors, with your name on the front page. I was alone at home, so I grabbed some wine, and I finished the whole thing in a night. I was impressed. You weren't when you came home. You looked like I had violated you curled up on the couch with your manuscript. I mean, I get it now. I didn't get it then, but I get it now. Rock, Paper, Scissors was your first screenplay that never made it to the screen. Your favorite story was now left dying in a desk drawer, and I'm sure it won't forever. And you trust me now. You've made me your first official reader since then, which I'm very proud of. I see the progression in your work. I know that you would rather see your own stories turn to film, but this is your job, and you're good at it. Sometimes when you're so deep into a project, I know that you're not coming up for a few days. You're here, you're here at the dining table eating dinner, on the couch reading, but you're not, you're not really here. You're in a different world. But thankfully, I like books too. Not your type though. You like horror and thrillers and crime novels. I'm not a fan. I think there's something seriously wrong with people who write dark and twisted fiction. I prefer a good love story. You're always in your own world, so I thought I should adopt a dog. I mean, I see abandoned puppies all day at work, right? But this one was different. As soon as I saw this black lab, this little furball, this cute little puppy, what kind of monster puts a tiny black lab in a shoebox and leaves him near the dumpster to die? He was maybe six weeks old, and I just knew he had to be mine. But when I asked you about it, you refused. You said, our dingy little flat is barely big enough space for us, and I have to work at home, and now a big dog... I get it, Adam. It's rational, but I was still mad at you. And the next day it was too late. Someone came in to adopt the dog. Of course, I have to do all the interviews. I like to judge each applicant, make sure that the right fit for the dog. And I was hoping for any reason in the world to turn down this applicant. So I braced to meet the new owners. I walk into the room. And there was a cute little black lab sitting all alone, wearing a fucking name tag. Who the hell do these owners think they are? Already acting like they own the dog. Not before I approve of them. I scooped up the puppy, angry, and I look at the name tag, and it didn't have a name. It said, will you marry me? And you opened the door and walked in. Oh my god. Half the team was watching us through the window as you got down on one knee, and I went into shock, and I saw the sapphire engagement ring, which had been your mother's, and I was so emotional. I teased you before I said yes, and I said, how about a game of rock, paper, scissors? And you said, okay, so if I lose, it's a yes. And I nodded because I always do scissors and you always do paper. So we both knew it wasn't a gamble. And that's how we got engaged. Anyway, I'm writing this because I loved your manuscript for Rock, Paper, Scissors. The man who writes a letter to his wife every year of their anniversary, even after she dies, that's inspired me to write you letters once a year. I don't know if I'll even show you these one day, but maybe one day our children can read about how, you know, we had a love story and how we lived happily ever after. Your future wife, XX. Meanwhile, Adam slammed the chapel doors closed. He's the one that did it. It wasn't the win. In fact, Adam didn't even know why he lied about it. He was just over it. He was over this whole experience. Even Bob, their dog, was over it. Bob, the friendly little black lab, was scratching at the walls, growling at the floor. I mean, he's never done this before, but it's too late. We gotta just find a room to sleep in. I mean, the whole place is dark. The first big room they find is this big, expansive kitchen. I mean, it looks cozy, very homey, given cottage vibes, vaulted ceilings, stained glass windows. It really could have been a magical ki kitchen one day on Architectural Digest. But right now, it's just covered in the layer of dust. There was a piece of paper on the counter. It read, Dear Amelia, Adam, and Bob, please make yourselves at home. The bedroom at the end of the landing has been made up for you. There's food in the freezer, wine in the crypt, and you'll find extra firewood in the log store out back, should you need it. We hope you enjoy your stay. Amelia put it down. Well, at least we know we're in the right place, right? And she's doing that thing. She's twisting the sapphire engagement ring around her finger, and she does that when she's nervous. It's one of her quirks. Adam used to find it cute. Not really anymore. It's just kind of annoying. Who's we? Huh? 
the note. It said, we hope you enjoy your stay. Who's, who's we? Who owns the place? Oh, I don't know. I just got an email saying that I want it. From who? I don't know. The housekeeper. She sent me the directions and pictures of the chapel. Oh, it's amazing. You're going to love it in the daylight. I can't wait. Okay, but what was her name? I don't know. What even makes you think it's a woman? Men are capable of cleaning too, even if you never do. All right. Not off to a good start, okay? So Amelia tries to make it up to him by hugging him, but it just doesn't feel natural. They haven't hugged in a while. They, they start exploring the ground floor and they find a kitchen, a large library, a lounge, wooden bookcases from the ceiling to the floor, stained glass windows. All the shelves are crammed with books, color coordinated. Someone had way too much time on their hands. There's a huge fireplace in the room, finally. So warm, felt so good. Amelia lights it right away. Still not that comforting though, because the storm is loud and it's causing the nearby tree branches to swing and scratch up against the stained glass windows, almost as if it's like fingernails scratching down. Adam, do you wanna turn on some music to drown out the storm? He looks over at her. It's like a little test, you know? <laughs> she knows he doesn't have his phone. And he knows why, he saw her. He saw her take it out of the glove compartment and rush back into the house to hide it. Then he sat in the car and listened to her lie about it, blaming him for forgetting it. He said, I thought I knew my wife, but I never knew her to act like this. She's clearly hiding something from me, and I think this trip will reveal some of our secrets, whether we like it or not. But it goes both ways. Just as Adam is suspicious of Amelia, she's got her eyes on her husband. He's acting strange, more strangely than ever, which is saying a lot. So she suggests, why don't we just make some frozen dinner? Should be nice, right? But when they walk into the cold kitchen filled with dust, the cupboards are empty, the freezer is nowhere to be found, the fridge isn't even plugged in. Even if it was, it's completely freaking empty. There's a coffee machine, but no coffee or tea. There's not even pots and pans. Just two wine glasses, two knives, two sets of plates. How do you even feed anyone? There's like two of everything. This place is a mansion. It's just strange. And as Amelia is looking around the kitchen for the food, she starts reminiscing about her husband and how he... He reminds her of all the lost puppies at work. Sometimes Amelia feels like she needs to protect him from the world, save him. And because of work, Amelia has gotten really good at recognizing who's good and who's bad. Sure, you think that she just works with dogs, but she interviews a lot of prospective owners. And a lot of them just want dogs as an Instagram, you know, prop, as a cute little trend. And for some reason, Amelia just felt like she needed to protect her husband from those people. Anyway, Adam helps her find the freezer, breaking her from her deep thoughts, and they find a section of nice food, just frozen lasagna, spaghetti, roast beef, steak pie, but they settle on chicken curry. Meanwhile, Adam finds the crypt for the wine. It's not one of those nice restaurant crypts where it's like a beautiful wine cellar. It's a wooden trap door on the floor, and you have to vertically just go down it and try not to fall, and it looks like a bunker of sorts. It's creepy to say the least. It, God knows what's down there. So the second letter starts now. February 28th, 2008, our first anniversary. Dear Adam, it's our first anniversary, and as promised, I'm writing my annual secret letter to you, just like the characters in your favorite screenplay. Anyway, even if you don't read the letters, I write. I still love the idea of looking back on them one day and reading them, when we're old, maybe. The first year of marriage has been wild. Getting married on a leap year was my idea. Going to Scotland for our honeymoon was yours. Scotland's beautiful. I hope we'll visit often. Now, this year, I tried to help you more with your reading and writing and even teaching myself, and you always ask me to read what you write, which just makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm part of your process. I just believe in you so much. So much so that when I read that he was dead on the newspaper, I was excited. I woke you up and I screamed, he's dead, he's dead. It's our one year anniversary, maybe not the best way to start the day, but you woke up rubbing your eyes and you said, who, who's dead, who? Of course. Henry Winter's agent! Henry Winter is your favorite author. I mean, all Adam did was talk about Henry Winter all the time and how he would have loved to see all of Henry's amazing works come onto the screen, but the old guy, Henry Winter, is famous for not being famous. He never does interviews, which adds to his mysterious appeal, I guess. You know, he writes murder mysteries and creepy thrillers, but he always wears the same thing. He's got a white mop for hair, the bluest eyes you'll ever see. There's like two pictures of him online and he always wears the same tweed jackets and bow ties. Personally, I don't think Henry Winters is that good. 
But that doesn't change the fact that he's one of the most successful authors in the world. And Adam loves him, which is something that she doesn't like about Adam. You know, Adam's kind of naive. Don't get me wrong, but Adam's one of the smartest people that she knows, but he only sees authors through rose-tinted glasses. He thinks somebody's ability to write a good book makes them a good person. She calms him down and said, no, Henry Winter isn't dead. That guy will probably stick around till he's 100. He's like a little parasite, but his agent is dead. Which means, I I'm not following. What does that mean? There's no gatekeeper now. Maybe his agent was the one making sure that none of his work got adapted, but the gatekeeper is gone. Maybe you can impress Henry Winter. I mean, just imagine if he said yes. Imagine if you take a, just take a chance. No, no, I'm not doing that. Henry's agent just died. The poor man's probably still grieving and it would be inappropriate. Yeah, well, you know what else is not appropriate? Not paying this month's rent. And then she hands them their first wedding anniversary gift. A homemade gift. They're not doing well financially, but she hoped it would mean the world to him. It's a paper crane. Paper is the traditional gift for the first wedding anniversary, and crane is a symbol of happiness and good fortune. It's meant to bring good luck. Adam loved it. He loved anything superstitious. He believed in luck and not opening umbrellas inside the house. He was one of those people. And it was cute, so he slipped it into his wallet. And within a couple of days, Adam had a gift of his own. A piece of paper with the words. He said yes. What? You are looking at the first screenwriter in history to ever be trusted to adapt one of Henry Winter's novels. Oh. What? I, I, I don't know. I think your lucky paper crane got me the gig. My agent called me out of the blue to say Henry Winter wanted to meet with me. I thought I was dreaming. I met with him this afternoon. I went to his place in London. It was like one of those crime novels. Walking through his library, I half expected someone to a a attack me with a candlestick. He's shorter than I imagined, but we just talked and talked, not about his novels, but everything else. I, I showed him the paper crane that you made me, and that was the only time that he smiled. It, it was surreal. When I left, my agent called me to tell me that Henry wanted me to adapt one of his first novels, The Doppelganger. He loves it. <gasps> we could sell it. I started crying tears of happiness, or at least some of them were tears of happiness. And for the first time since we got married, I have a new secret that I have to keep from you. And I'm not sure I can ever share this secret with you. But I worry that if you knew Henry Winter only trusted you with his book was because of me, it might be the end of us. Amelia is nervous, but Adam is just walking down the crypt and he hits his head a few times and his torch goes out, but he manages to find a light switch. He comes up with a fancy bottle of wine. Happy to report there are no ghosts or gar gargoyles, just racks and racks of wine. And they sit in front of the crackling fire, eating their curry chicken and drinking wine. Amelia almost tried to hold his hand once, but she stopped herself. Just felt weird, foreign. She felt bad. She hadn't been completely honest about this weekend. Or really a lot of things. And it feels like he knows. She said, we're trying to use this weekend to mend our broken marriage, but what Adam doesn't know is that if things don't go according to plan, only one of us will be going home. Meanwhile, Adam is off in his own world again. He's staring at the library and he thinks about his career, how he's already adapted three of Henry Winter's novels as films. He is so proud of each one. He has made a name for himself. People come knocking on his door for his screenwriting work. Henry Winter would have loved this lounge. It's more of a library than anything. Maybe it's time for Adam to start working on his own pieces. And it's almost like Amelia read his mind. You know, maybe you should visit one of your old screenplays while you're taking some time in between projects. Like the one that you spent years uh, working on? Why not take another look at it? Adam was annoyed. She can't even remember the name of one of his favorites. It shouldn't bother him, but she used to be a lot more interested in his work. When they first met, she genuinely used to care about his writing, but now she's indifferent. So Adam takes out the paper crane from his wallet. You know, I, I've been carrying this paper bird around with me for such a long time. I know. I showed it to Henry Winter the first time I met him in his fancy London house. Yeah, I, I remember the story. She sounds bored and miserable. And that kind of annoyed Adam, but I guess that's what happens when you've been married for so long. There's no new stories. I mean, he gets bored of Amelia's same old stories too. And before he can act, Amelia snatches the paper crane from his hands and she says, you live too long living in the past instead of focusing on the future and threw it into the fire. Adam jumps up, grabs it, he almost burns his hand in the process. One edge is cinched, but otherwise it's intact. But that was the final act. Adam didn't know for sure, but he was for sure now. He was counting down the hours till all of this was over for good. 
The third letter. Second wedding anniversary. February 28th, 2010. Dear Adam, what a great year. What a great anniversary. It is the first adaptation of Henry Winter's novel has been sold. You have been so busy. You sold it for more than what I would make in 10 years, which is amazing. And also sad because now we have even less time to spend together. I feel like you're kind of pulling away. You don't seem to want my input as much anymore. You were really stressed the other day and I asked you if you needed help and you said, what do you know? I just work with dogs, right? I get it. But then you surprised me. You made it seem like we were going on vacation, but instead you brought me to this fancy posh area in London with a bunch of residential homes and you told me happy anniversary. You passed me a small velvet box and it was strange. I thought it was earrings, but it was an iron key. If you could live in any house on this street, which one would you choose? And she looked in front of her at the house, the old Victorian house with ivy taking over the front half of the house. The windows were boarded up and smashed. It was a fixer upper. That was putting it lightly. Okay, it was like not even livable. But the house was everything she ever dreamed of. And she screamed. They ran inside. The inside was even worse. The whole place smelled moldy, missing doors, missing floorboards, peeling wallpaper. But it was their dream. Neither of them had ever, ever been scared of some hard work. So this, this is going to be their home. She was in love. And so was he. And there were so many rooms. The idea of filling them with kids just made her so happy. But back to present day. Amelia's not so happy. She doesn't know why she tried to burn his special crane. She just wanted to get his attention, okay? To fix their marriage, and he's not listening. I'm just tired of being the only one making an effort in this relationship. We, we never talk anymore. It's like living with a roommate, not a husband. You never ask me about my day or my work or how I'm feeling, or you just ask me, what's for dinner? Where's my blue shirt? Have you seen my keys? I have my own life, you know, and you make me feel so invisible. And she starts crying. And Adam, in a rare display of affection, hugs her. I'm sorry. And they kiss for the first time in a long time. And Amelia decides to grab the rest of the wine that they left in the kitchen. And as she's walking past the stained glass window, something catches her eye in the window. It was a face. Amelia screams, dropping the entire bottle of wine, sending it crashing, shattering at her feet. The face in the window was real, and someone was outside, and they were staring straight at Amelia. Adam hears the scream, he rushes to comfort her, and he helps her clean up. And he asks her, do, do you need your inhaler? Y your asthma sends you in a panic, do you need me to grab it? It's okay, it's okay. He calms her down, but it only has the opposite effect, because of course it does. He's like, you know, the whole place is creepy, and we've been drinking a lot. Are you sure you didn't just imagine a face? Amelia's like, not pleased. No, of course I didn't just imagine it. There was a face in the window looking straight at me. Okay, sorry. Was it a man, a woman? I don't know. It all happened so fast. I told you, I, I screamed and then they ran off. Okay, well, let me get my coat and I'll take a look. No, please, please just don't go out there. But he takes Bob and Adam heads out. And it's clear what she saw because he was met with several pairs of eyes staring straight at him. The fourth letter third wedding anniversary. This year, the anniversary was a bit different. Instead of alone, we spent it at this huge Hollywood party with hundreds of people. I know you hate parties, but you're always invited because you're a hot shot now. Ever since Henry Winter started working with you, everyone <laughs> wants to work with you. The same people that used to look down on you. Now they all want to be your friend. Have a go with you. Well, it's our anniversary and um, I'm at the party with you. Not because it's our anniversary, but because everyone in Hollywood has massive egos and they don't know that you have face blindness. That's not a good combination. So before anyone approaches, I have to whisper their names to your ear so that their egos aren't bruised. And there's a lot of people approaching you now. I guess it's nice to dress up once in a while. I even chug champagne because, well, I mean, you stopped asking and I stopped telling you, but I'm still not pregnant. You hate socializing. The only reason that we're here is because you saw Henry Winters on the guest list. You adapted one of his books and now what? Maybe you're hoping he'll give you another? Throw you another bone? You kept asking me through the night, uh, is Henry here now? What about now? Is Henry here? I said I couldn't see him and you look like a sad little boy that had been stood up. I don't tell you on the way home that I saw Henry Winters several times that night. Cool. He looked older than his photos. His hair was thick white and the pale skin and those blue eyes. It was like looking at a ghost. I didn't tell you that he was staring at you all night, constantly following us around the party, desperately trying to get your attention. Three years together and 
Still so many secrets. I wonder, do you keep secrets from me too? What? Back to the chapel we go. So the pair of eyes staring directly at Adam and Bob are sheep. <laughs> yeah, the sheep are back. No wonder Bob has been barking up a storm and growling. Now, one day was going to be a funny story of the sheep, but probably not today. Adam tries to reassure Amelia that she was just drunk and saw the sheep's eyes and freaked out, and he tells her, you know, the deadly words of, just relax. Amelia isn't relaxed. She remembers what she saw, and she's certain it wasn't a freaking sheep. She felt like she was being watched. And then, here comes the final POV that we're missing. The person that got the couple to Blackwater Chapel. Robin. Robin was outside the window. It wasn't the sheep. She couldn't help it. It's been a long time since anyone came to visit. She just wanted a quick peek. She's been watching them afar from her cottage for a while, and the little couple and their dog. Ooh. She was surprised they made it. The storm was brewing strong. Who on earth would be crazy enough to risk the mountain lanes in this type of weather? It's a miracle that they didn't die on their way here. Nobody comes to a place like this unless they want to get cut off from the rest of the world. Robin watched as the couple pulled up in that old-fashioned mint green vintage car. It looked old enough to be in a museum. How on earth did they not die? She knew she shouldn't have, but she just wanted to get a closer look, you know? She saw the big black dog jump out the back. She was always fond of animals, but sheep weren't the best around big dogs. The man looked tired, miserable, but road trips will do that to you. Robin was the one that let them in. Honestly, she kind of felt kind of bad. They looked defeated in the cold snow, and the woman was fascinating. <laughs> Robin watched her, of everything about her, her long blonde hair, her expertly applied makeup, her fashionable clothes. Robin's not trying to be a pick-me or anything, but she's the total opposite of her. Robin's hair is long and gray now, and she cuts the tangles when it gets bothersome, and her cheeks are red, not from makeup, but from the brutal cold winds. She just wished that she could hear what they were talking about. Look at them, lighting candles, the dog on the rug. They look so in love, but looks can be deceiving. Because she knew that the couple had made some poor choices in their lives, and coming here was probably on the top of their list. Back to Adam and Amelia. So Adam asked Amelia to go down into the crypt to get another bottle of wine. And she doesn't want to, but the feminist in her made it impossible to say no, that she was too scared. So she crawls down there with no light, the torch had gone out, and she turns on the little cellar light, and it's so creepy, just creepy. There's racks of dusty wines, but you could see these metal rings embedded to the walls. It almost looked like the type of things that you would chain people to. There were scratches on the walls, scratches? Was someone kept here down against their will? And while Amelia is wondering all these things, the lights go out and the trap door slams shut. Robin hated grocery shopping. She had to make the journey to town, to the local store, to get groceries before a storm. That's how it always worked. Fruits and veggies are always sold out. The townspeople get them all, but that's not what she's stocking up. She likes to get matches, candles, and some canned food. Canned food made her feel safe. She liked to know that she would never, have an, she would never starve. Oh, and baby food. She added the baby food to her basket, knowing everyone was judging her. Everyone's looking at her. She knew it. They knew better than to ask, though. They all knew that she didn't have a baby. She hurried back to the cottage with her groceries, and the cottage was really the only place that Robin felt safe nowadays. It was close to Blackwater Chapel. Her mom used to take her here when she was young. Her mom would bring little Robin to the cottage anytime she wanted to run away or hide. Robin's mom was a happy person. She loved to sing and cook and sew, and she just had this talent of making everything look beautiful. Even this depressing cottage, any time Robin's mom and dad would get into a fight, they would come into this cottage and they would make these homemade curtains and these cushions, and they had candles and blankets for warmth. But now all of that is gone. Robin's mom is gone. And with the storm coming and the electricity out, Robin started a fire with some candles. She tied a can of baked beans above the flames. And when she finishes her dinner, she opens a jar of baby food and pours it into a bowl. She knows he'll come to eat whenever he's hungry. And now it's just a waiting game. She could see the chapel from the windows. The lights are still on. Unlike her little cottage, the chapel still had power because the owner suffered a lot of outages. They installed a generator. Robin's staring out the window and she dozes off. And then she opens her eyes to see the chapel lights are off. Seems like the visitor's good luck had just run out. And then Robin hears the tiny little footsteps behind her. She looks back and the bowl of baby food is empty. Licked clean. And that made her happy.
Meanwhile, Amelia is stuck in the crypt with no light, so that's great. Adam rushes down with her inhaler. She's having a full-on panic attack, and he explains that he was holding the trap door open, the lights went off, and he was so scared he accidentally shut it closed. Here's, <laughs> he's here now. You have one job. <laughs> he's going to get her out. He should feel guilt, though, but he doesn't for some strange reason, okay? So the two of them get out and they start heading upstairs to find their bedroom for the night. And Amelia can't help but stare at the pictures on the wall as they step on each step up. So the whole staircase, there's the pictures up against the railing and there's three frames that are missing from the wall. And you can tell because the wall is a slightly lighter shade from where the pictures used to be and there's rust colored nails that are still protruding out of the wall. Weird. When they get to the second floor, there's four doors in front of them. All of them are closed and locked and they look exactly the same except for two. One is unlocked, I'm assuming that's their room, and another one says, danger, keep out. And then another note on their door that says, no dogs in the bedroom, please. We hope you enjoy your stay. Bob will be fine. He's good at sleeping anywhere, anytime. So they leave Bob's bed out in the hallway, and he graciously climbs into it. And they open the door to their bedroom, and the lights are back on. And they're standing in shock. The bedroom is a carbon copy of their bedroom at home. What? Okay, so not exactly a carbon copy, but practically a carbon copy. The furniture is different, sure, but the pillows, the blankets, the throws, the walls are even painted in the exact same shade of mole's breath that Amelia had redecorated their room as a surprise a few years ago that Adam hated, but now here they were in the copy of their bedroom. Adam? I don't... I don't understand what I'm looking at right now. It looks a bit like our... This is so strange. Well, we don't have stained glass windows or the antique looking clock in the corner, but but you don't think this is weird? I mean, yes and no. They probably got the same idea as the place that you bought it. Didn't you, you know, buy everything in the bedroom for from that one company because they gave you like 50% off? You fell in love with a picture in their catalog and you bought literally all of it. I definitely remember the bill. Maybe whoever owns the place did the same thing. I mean, it kind of made sense, but what? Like, what's weird is that even though every other room had been covered in dust, this one felt fresh and new and clean, like the furniture was new and the, the bedding was new. Well, isn't that a good thing that they cleaned the place up? Yeah, but Adam, the rest of the rooms were dusty and it just feels so inauthentic. It feels like we're in a movie of our lives and someone just dressed the set with cheap replicas of the originals. I don't know, I think it's cool. Thankfully for Creeped Out Amelia, the bathroom looked nothing like theirs back at home, but on the downside, the pipes were frozen, so no hot showers, no running water at all, and Adam and Amelia decide to keep warm a different way. Sex. Which is totally strange, because they haven't done it in ages. Amelia said that when they first started dating, they couldn't ke keep their hands off of each other. But now, it's a little bit different. But taking off her clothes makes her feel miserable, if she's being honest. Her body just didn't look like the way it used to. So she scurries off into the bathroom to freshen up and comes out in her black lingerie set that she had packed. And she tries her sexiest pose at the door. You know what I mean? She's like, but there's no need. It's literally pointless. Guess why? He fell asleep. No, the bedroom is empty. Adam is gone. <laughs> So she looks going to look for this guy and Adam is too busy exploring the keep out danger sign. I mean, curiosity killed the cat, right? How can you put up a sign like that and not expect someone to go up the stairs? So he braces for impact, slowly turns the handle. He's impressed. It's opening. He opens it up and he looks into the room, but it's not a room. It's not exactly what he was expecting. It's, it's like an anticlimactic stairway and at the top there's another door. Okay, well, I'm sure that door is locked, right? But he hopes not. He makes his way up the stairs, braces for impact, and again, the handle jiggles and it opens. He opens the door and almost falls back with the force of the cold wind. It's the bell tower of the chapel. You know, the big giant bells? Yeah. The air feels like it's stabbing at him, but the view is fantastic, phenomenal. You can see the whole world from up there. The, the valley, the lakes, the mountains, the... The distance, the full moon, the sky is black, but it's decorated with stars and the bell is huge and it's, it's surrounded by these knee-high white walls. No safety railing, but it's, it's worth the risk to get a view like this. It seems insane that something so magical has been here this whole time. Adam takes out his phone to take a picture. The same phone that his wife thought that he left at home? Of course he grabbed it out Wait again. Wait a minute, what <laughs> is going on? Adam knows a lot more than Amelia thinks he knows. He knows that she went to go see a financial advisor recently. Then, a few weeks ago when she thought he was drunk, she had drunkenly had him sign a life insurance policy. She said, I just think we're at the age where we need to plan ahead, you know? Amelia, I'm, I'm 40. 
And, and what if something happened to you? I can't afford to live in this big house by myself on my salary. Bob and I would be homeless. What? You wouldn't be homeless. Worst case, you might have to downsize a little, that's all. Amelia shook her head and forced the pen into his hand. And he signed it because it's what, maybe it's her parents that died before she was born. Maybe it was all the sad things she sees at work every day, but it was, it was just strange. She seemed preoccupied with death. He said, my wife is planning something, I'm sure of it. I'm just not sure what. Amelia wasn't always like that, but nowadays it's clear. She wants to change Adam. Everybody wants to change Adam. Started with his mom, and then, you know, when their dad walked out on them, mom started working double shifts at the hospital to raise him by herself. They lived in this dingy area, and she would yell at him for watching too much TV, but he was, he was captivated by the stories. So they negotiated that he started reading instead. And for his 13th birthday, she gifted him 13 books, all special editions by authors that he loved and adored. He still has them. On one of those books, Adam's mom wrote, enjoy the stories of other people's lives, but don't forget to live your own. And then she died three months later. Everything Adam has done now is to try and make her proud. And it was the worst time of Adam's life when his mom died. My wife wasn't always trying to change me though. For the first time in my life, I felt like I found someone who loved me, for me. And I, she didn't want to change me, anything. I could finally be myself. That's why I loved her so much in the beginning. But you know, marriage has a way of changing people whether you like it or not. We're truly alone here, which is what I think my wife wanted. People should be more careful about what they wish for though. There's a side to my wife that nobody else sees because she's really good at hiding it. Just because she works at an animal shelter doesn't make her a saint. There are forests less shady than my wife. I'm not pretending to be blameless in all of this. I never thought that I was the kind of man who would cheat on his wife. But I did. And somehow she found out. And I suppose that makes me the bad guy. But there's a bad girl in this story too. Two wrongs sometimes make an ugly. And I wasn't the only one who slept with someone they shouldn't have. So did Saint Amelia. Amelia finds Adam deep in his thoughts up in the cold freezing bell tower and he told her to bring a bottle of wine and a couple of blankets. The view is just too good. So they start enjoying the view and Amelia suggests that they go downstairs to sleep. Her teeth are chattering, clattering, whatever. And he says, sure, whatever you want, my love. And he only calls her that when he's drunk. So he's drunk. They stand up and suddenly it's spooky again because they were sitting on the ground. A small loss of balance and both of them are drunk and one of them would be dead. Amelia gets up and grabs onto the bell to steady herself, but she hears like this really weird noise when she touches the bell, like this intense screeching. It takes her a second to realize what just happened. Bats. Hundreds of bats were in the bell and now they were flying out at them, dangerously close at the couple. Adam loses his balance, his arms are flailing around, he stumbles and his eyes are wide. He reaches for Amelia, but she's paralyzed with fear. She's like not processing what's going on and he falls hard against one of the white walls, but part of it crumbles and falls to the ground. Finally, Amelia snaps out of it and grabs his arm and yanks him back to safety. She said, I saved him, but he's not grateful. I'm not sure what he is. I've never seen that expression on him, but it scares me. Adam's actually pissed. He's thinking she almost let me fall. That is not something that Adam will ever forget. He wants to leave right now. He doesn't even remember them talking about it. They are just leaving now. The road is dark, he knew it would be, but at least they were out of that creepy ass chapel and he felt relief. So cold though. They hadn't come across a single car since they started on their way back. But then he saw it. A woman walking on the road in the distance. She was dressed in a, is that a red coat? No, it's, it's a red kimono. And she's soaked, she's covered in, she's it's like been rained on or snowed on. And what is that she's holding? Adam tells Amelia to slow down, but she doesn't hear. And instead she seems to speed up. And Adam's yelling, slow down! But she keeps going faster and faster and he sees the speed go from 70 to 80 to 90 and then the dial spins out of control and Adam covers his eyes. And when he looks up, he sees the rain is now red. The woman is suspended in the air with her silk red kimono behind her like a cape. Amelia is screaming, wake up, wake up. Adam squints his eyes. He's no longer in the car, he's in the bed. The woman, the woman. What woman, Adam, what? Oh, again? Adam has these nightmares and he wakes up covered in sweat. 
Amelia tries to comfort him. It, it's okay, there's no woman in red. You're here with me, you're safe, it's just a dream. There's no woman in the red kimono. She's not real. Amelia shook. And after the almost fall off the bell tower, Adam refused to even talk to her. He rolled into the bed and passed out immediately. Now he was having those nightmares again, so maybe it was the wine. Or maybe it was the almost falling. You know, he doesn't have these nightmares all the time, but when they do, it's bad. And Amelia does what she always does. She rummages through her purse and pulls out her notepad. A little pen. Okay, let's write down what you saw. What did you see? It's fine, Amelia. We don't have to do this today. Yes, we do. Adam starts to tell her. The woman in the kimono, she's in her 40s, attractive, wearing red lipstick. She's British, not Japanese, but loves her kimono. Adam doesn't have to say who she is because both of them already know who it is. Sometimes there's a teenage boy in the dreams who's terrified that it's raining. And there's always a car and it always goes down the same. The car, the woman, the accident. It happens in the same way most of the time. But it's not just a nightmare. It was Adam's real life. That's how his mom died. He was 13 years old and he couldn't recognize the driver of the car. It's been close to 30 years now since it happened and he watched in slow motion as the car collided with his mom and then they drove off, leaving his mom limp on the pavement. That's the thing about face blindness. In those moments, it would haunt Adam forever. He would never know if whoever was driving the car was someone that he knew. Maybe a friend, a teacher, a neighbor. All the faces looked the same to him. So when the police were questioning him, he was unable to provide them with any details. He could be staring at the driver in a police lineup and still not be able to point out who it is. And for that, he will always blame himself. It's his fault. He said his mom was walking the dog that he begged her to get, but refused to take care of. When you're 13, you say, Mom, I'll walk the dog. I promise I'll do it. But you don't. So she was walking that dog. Amelia is sad listening to his stories because it's clear that he idolizes his mom. I mean, Amelia's thinking, I'm sure his mom was nice, sure, but she wasn't perfect. He always puts her up on a pedestal. He always conveniently forgets why she was wearing a red kimono. It's what she wore when her male friends came to visit. Their little apartment had thin walls where Adam would hear that they were all just more than friends. And his mom had a new friend practically every single week. And that's why Amelia writes all his dreams down because his memories, they shapeshift. He sees what he wants to see. This way they can gather everything and try to fix Adam. That's all Amelia ever wanted, was to freaking fix Adam. She tried everything, podcasts before bed, herbal teas, the nightmares, they're not always there, but they won't stop for good. So she jots down her notes, takes her prescription sleeping pills cause she's exhausted, and they try to go back to sleep. Meanwhile, Robin is not trying to sleep. She's outside the chapel. She recognized the man as soon as he got out of the car. He looks older now, but Robin never forgets a face. She thinks back at what happened when he was just a little boy, what he saw, how he felt. She wondered if he still had those nightmares. Maybe it's time he learned the truth, and he probably wasn't gonna like it. But whoever really likes the truth? Robin gets to the big wooden doors to the chapel and slips her key from her pocket and lets herself in. This is just the beginning. Nobody has played their cards yet because they don't even know that they're being dealt. Fifth letter, fourth anniversary, Linen. Dear Adam, it's been a rough year. You let me down. You were supposed to be there. After three years of trying, doctor after doctor, round of IVF after round of IVF, you were supposed to be there. I mean, that's not how we wanted to spend our anniversary, but it was the earliest that the IVF doctor could get us in. I guess it wasn't as important to you as it was for me. I called you five times. You never replied. Sometimes I wish you cared about me like you cared about work. I wonder if all writers are egomaniacs with low self-esteem, or maybe it's just you. Any attention from someone in the business about your story and you're like a dog in heat. So you're at lunch meeting for a work that you promised would end in time and I'm at the clinic alone. You say these appointments are hard for you, but you get to jerk off in a cup in a bathroom. I have to spread my legs and have all sorts of doctors and nurses pry me open, stab me with things, scan me, pump me full of drugs, operate on me, and all we want is just a child. And guess what? I'm pregnant. I guess you didn't get the news because you weren't here and that made me angry, but our child is here, growing inside of me. I still hate you for not being here, but I'm kind of in shock. I told you in anger when I got home and you were so happy and you cried when I told you I was pregnant and I cried when I showed you the skin and then we ordered pizza and sat there gorging on pizza while I drank lemonade from a champagne flute. And then you gave me your gift, a linen cushion with the words stitched. She believed so she could. And it was beautiful. You believed I could get pregnant before I could. 
and I was in disbelief. This meant something. It was such a happy moment. But when I look up at you, but when I looked up at you with adoring eyes, you looked shocked. You were staring at my legs, and there was a thick trickle of bright red blood making its way down to my slipper. <sighs> we rushed to the hospital oh to God. confirm, and it was a miscarriage. And when I got home, I noticed my watch stopped at three minutes past eight. I wondered if that's when my child died. I can never wear that watch ever again. Anyway, I like writing these letters. They're more for me than for you, I guess. It's cathartic. I know if you ever found them, it would destroy you. That's why I hide them. A reminder of what we almost had. And inside the letter is the envelope the clinic gave me. The scan of our baby. Or what was our baby? Amelia heard a noise downstairs. She was sure of it. She was frozen in fear though. She wants to reach for Adam, but she can't move. And then she hears the sound of the door handle of their bedroom start to jingle. She practically falls out of bed, rushes to the bathroom to hide. And she's, you know, holding her breath. She finds the nearest freaking weapon, which is a Gillette razor. And she's holding it on for dear earth. What is she gonna do? <laughs> exactly. Give her a little shaving. Yeah, and then all of a sudden she hears, Amelia, are you okay? Is everything okay? What? Adam, is that you? Yeah, who else would it be? What are you doing in the bathroom holding your razor? I went down to grab some water and I guess all the pipes are frozen. None of the taps work and the power's freaking out. I guess it took out the generator. I tried to find the fuse box, but no luck. I thought I heard a noise. Oh my God, you scared me. I thought I heard something too. That's why I woke up, but the front doors are still locked and that's the only way in and out of this place. And I got the key in my pocket. No sheep are broken in, so that's good. I, I don't like it here. Yeah, well, me either. Maybe we should leave in the morning. Find a nice hotel a bit closer to town. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay, and well, we can try to get some sleep now, right? Then in the morning, when it's bright, we'll pack and head out of here. Why don't you try taking another sleeping pill? Maybe it'll help. She probably shouldn't have, because the warning ta labels tell her not to, but Amelia was exhausted. And she popped another pill, and she laid down, and she curiously glances at the grandfather clock in the corner. It's set to three minutes past eight. That seems weird. But before she can do anything, the meds kicked in. Adam waited till Amelia fell asleep and he snuck out of the bed again. For however many times today, he went downstairs with Bob, knowing exactly which steps not to step on because he knew which ones were creepy, and he wished that he could go for a run. He loved going on runs, that always helped him clear his mind. Amelia didn't like that he went on runs, she assumed it meant that he was trying to cheat on her. One time, he caught her throwing away his running shoes in the trash. Not normal behavior don't you think? It's ridiculous. I mean, sure, Adam is attracted to other people, but he's not ever going to act on it. I mean, yeah, these days he does imagine being with someone else instead, but doesn't everyone have fantasies? And it doesn't mean anything if you don't act on them. Because the last time he slept with someone that he shouldn't have, it did not end well for him, and he's learned a stupid little lesson. Besides, he's too busy working, and he doesn't have time for an affair these days. But still, Amelia doesn't trust him. And he gets it. She probably shouldn't. He's never really been completely honest with her. Like how he was the one that turned off the generator. <sighs> and how at night he would crush up sleeping pills into her tea. Things that she doesn't need to know. Sixth letter, fifth anniversary, would. Dear Adam, sorry I've been acting jealous recently. It's been hard not to. The heartbreak of the miscarriage was killing me and our marriage and now we just treat Bob like our baby. We had our first big fight in a while and I, I feel guilty about it, but can you blame me? You came home drunk way later than you should have. And you sat there giggling about this actress that you were having lunch with who fell in love with your manuscript, Rock, Paper, Scissors, and she wanted to play the lead. October O'Brien? I googled her. I was even more pissed when I found out how beautiful she was. And you just had this shit eating grin on your face. And you said, I mean, her thoughts about how to improve the script are just genius. God, you're gonna love her. She's just simply delightful, so charming and clever, and I, I, I've got a much better chance with an actress like October attached. If she knocks on doors in LA, they're gonna open for her. Listen, it's a shame that you're still not passionate about your career because maybe you would understand how I feel. What? That's not fair. We don't all want to rule the world. Some of us just want to make it a better place. She just wanted him to be proud of her and he wasn't, and it was devastating. Sometimes she felt like she sacrificed her life and her career for his ideas, which always shined brighter than hers, and it just consumed her life. And then as if it couldn't get any worse, Adam said he had to go meet October and his agent for a quick lunch on their anniversary. And then he took her out to see her gift. 
on their once perfect front lawn was now a fucking magnolia tree. No leaves, no flowers, just fucking branches sitting in the middle of the once beautiful garden that she worked so hard on. Wow, a tree. It's, um, perfect. Sorry, uh, it's sweet. It's really sweet. Sorry, I mean, I love it. I'm, I mean, I will love it when it starts blooming. It's, it's the perfect gift. It's wood. This year is wood. Thank you. And just like that, Adam was out the door heading over to his very important lunch with very important people. But of course, from work, she came home early to try and cook some dinner. And guess who she finds sitting in her fucking kitchen? October O'Brien. And she was, you know what? She was even more beautiful online. Her skin was flawless. Her hair was beautiful. She looked like a princess with big green eyes and a big white smile. She was literally walking perfection. And to top it off, she was so fucking nice. Don't you just hate those people? She chimed in. Sorry, Adam said that he's never made you an anniversary dinner and I told him I would never work with someone who hasn't done that for their wife. So I was gonna help him cook something, but maybe it's not a good surprise. And that night, October helped them cook and she stayed for their anniversary. The food was delicious. October was a talented woman, but she was so modest too and so sweet and disturbingly beautiful. She thought that she'd be more jealous, but honestly, she liked her a lot. Now back to present time. We have a Robin hiding inside the chapel, almost getting caught twice, and she knows she's like hiding in the she's hiding in the secret room. I mean, it's not a secret if you know what you're looking for. So in the library lounge area, there's this door that you can enter. It's like a hidden door. And it reveals more books adorned on the walls, a stained glass window, and this old mahogany oak desk in the center and she she hated this room robin felt it was claustrophobic a place of very bad memories so in the hiding spot robin hears the couple planning to leave first thing in the morning and she's like laughing to herself there is no way they're leaving in fact after what she saw and heard robin was fairly sure that at least one of them would never leave ever again amelia wakes up to the dark outside and um she's shaking adam awake Psst, bob is gone Bob is not here. She frantically explains that she searched the entire place. She went to go get some water. Downstairs everywhere, Bob is gone. And it doesn't make sense because the front doors are locked. He doesn't have a key. Even if he did, how would Bob open the key? So where on earth is Bob? So they both rush out of the bed, put on some clothes, and hurry down the stairs. Amelia notices that Adam is able to skip some of the steps. And every time she steps on those that he skipped, they creak loudly. How did you know which steps not to step on? Huh? You skipped the ones that creak the loudest. Oh, well, you know, it annoys me. But we just got here last night. How do you know which... Listen, I may not remember faces, Amelia, but facts and figures that most people tend to overlook, they stick to my mind. You know that about me. Amelia thinks it's strange, but she'll worry about it after they find Bob. They try everything, from room to room. Some of the rooms are locked, so they can't get in, but they even try putting food into his bowl, hoping he'll hear the sound. And when they finally decide to try outside, they open the big wooden doors, and the snow is up to their knees. There is no way. If Bob is out there, he would not be lasting very long. So throughout the whole dog search, the couple confess two things. Adam confesses two things, actually. One, he finally tells Amelia that he brought his phone, and yeah, he's using the flashlight to look for Bob. And two, that he opened one of the kitchen drawers last night while grabbing water, and... And she's like, okay, we'll get to the point. <sighs> the drawer is filled to the brim of old newspaper articles about October O'Brien. The actress who- I know who she is, Adam. It's not something I'm likely to forget. But I don't understand. Why would they have newspaper articles of just her? And when I was in the crypt looking for Bob just now, I found this. Amelia snatched it out of his hand. It was a pamphlet. Look, read it. I don't think we're welcome here, Amelia. What? Then why would they invite us? She starts reading through the history of Blackwater Chapel. There are rumors that the father who used to run the chapel fell from his death from the bell tower, but it hasn't been confirmed. The true story of the chapel is a bit murky. According to excavations in the crypt to check the foundation, the chapel was discovered to have been a spot to prison witches back in the day. They were tied to the crypt walls before they were burned at the stake. Women and children were killed and buried in the floor under Blackwater Chapel. Some skeletons were tested as young as five years old. It's said that if you can still hear them in this crypt whispering your name, most locals are way too scared to even get near the chapel. They stay away for their own good. Almost all the builders involved in the renovation said the crypt was inexplicably cold, no matter what the season. So Amelia's over it. She's like, yeah, we gotta find Bob and we gotta get the hell out of here. They start searching outside and they see a small graveyard behind the chapel. 
Okay, great. It's getting worse. And interestingly enough, every single bathroom in the chapel had what looked like clawfoot bathtubs that were ripped from the bathrooms. So you could see where the bolts for the bathtubs were used. And now they were all in the back of the chapel serving as some sort of planters. It was strange. There were wooden sculptures all throughout the back of the chapel in the snow. Most of them were hand-carved rabbits that looked like they were leaping out from the ground. Some were owls and turtles, and they all had these very spooky eyes. Like, you couldn't help but feel like they were watching you. Adam, what if someone took Bob? What? Why? I don't know, but remember that little cottage that we drove past on our way here? Yeah, it looks stranded. Let's just check. Ask for help. They're a lot closer to the main road than us. Maybe they have power or a phone to use. And it's not that far of a walk, right? Amelia knew that Adam never really wanted a puppy. And he tried to hide it, but he loves that dog as much as she does. So he said, okay, fine, let's go. It takes them a while to reach the cottage, maybe 15 minutes. They really weren't dressed for the weather. Their shoes, their feet are soaking wet. You know, their shoes are not waterproof. They're knocking on the door of the cottage, no answer. But when they look up, there's smoke coming out of the chimney, so someone must be home. They just can't hear us. Adam says, I'm gonna go to the back of the house and see if I can look in. Amelia stays in the front, and when he gets to the back, he looks like he's seen a ghost. And maybe he has. What happened? What happened? I knocked on the back window, and there was a woman sitting inside next to a fire. And I knocked, and she got up this close to my face to the window, and she was just holding this, like, bunny rabbit in her arms, and there was like a hundred candles around her. And she closed the curtain right in my face. We were this close. I think her power is out, too, but it was weird. Like, she's like a witch catching a, casting a spell or something. Don't be dumb, Adam. It's that stupid freaking pamphlet that you read. No, but she had an animal on her lap, and it was creepy. I don't think she wants to help us. Robin was pissed. She didn't just close one curtain in his face. She closed them all. She blew out all her candles. And there were a few, not a hundred, but, you know, he's very good at exaggerating, isn't he? She couldn't believe he would be so rude enough to trespass on her property. Then Robin went to the front door to listen to that couple that were talking about her on her front porch. Those freaking idiots. And they just start talking shit about her. And you know what? It is rude. Especially because they might not know who Robin is, but she sure as hell knows who they are. She's the one that invited them here after all. They just didn't know that. Amelia suggests knocking again. Mmm, not a good idea. She looked like a nut job. Shh! She could probably hear you. How do you even know it's a she? I don't know, long gray hair? Then if it is a woman, maybe she'll respond better to me if I try talking to her. Do you think that she's the one that you saw outside the window last night? I don't know, maybe she's the housekeeper. Oh, no. <laughs> if she's the housekeeper, she's horrible. If she had a broom, she doesn't use to clean it. She probably just flies around on it at night. Her place is a mess. Amelia starts panicking and looking around again, and she says, Okay, fine. Let's just... Hey, there's a hill over there. Maybe we can climb up the hill and get a better view and try to see if we spot Bob anywhere. Or maybe someone else that can help us. Another chimney with smoke. So Adam agrees, and they head off. Some people think that money is the answer to all of life's problems, but not Robin. She can't be bought. So she looks out the window to check that they're gone. They're near the top of the hill, and now it's safe for her to go back out. She puts her coat on, and Oscar stares at her. Yeah, she has a house rabbit, okay? Turns out they make amazing companions. She slips out a red leather collar inside her pocket and heads to the chapel alone. She knows what happened to Bob because she took him. And she doesn't feel guilty about it at all. Even though she used to own a dog herself, she knows how upset owners get when their dog is gone. But bad people deserve bad things to happen. The seventh letter, sixth anniversary. Dear Adam, it's been a good year. Henry Winter asked you to adopt another novel for a film, a horror murder mystery. It's called The Black House. And now your screenplay, Rock, Paper, Scissors, is in production too. We've got October to thank for that. You, October, and the producer have been spending ungodly amounts of time together. <laughs> but it's okay. You know, not that I mind because October has been so generous. She even let us use her South of France estate for our anniversary and it was, it was beautiful. We strolled around Paris and we, we did it nonstop which was a bit weird because there were these big pictures of October everywhere, and I couldn't help but hope that you were thinking of me and not her. We picked up a letter at her place and it said R. O'Brien. I said, oh, I didn't know October was married. Uh, she's not. October is her stage name. She's trying to keep her private life private. And then you quickly changed the topic. But overall, it was a happy year, and here's to many more. And now the couple were on top of the hill. 
climbing up that snowy hill. So that's great. Marriage is weird. Both of them have their own struggles. You know, Amelia struggles because she feels like she doesn't fit in with Adam and his life. And even when she walks the dog, she has nothing in common with the neighbors. She can't help but feel like Adam climbs higher and higher on the success level. And the more she feels like a total failure, he's the real deal. And she's just, she's like a first draft of one of his screenplays. And Adam, well, he seems to be falling out of love with his wife, just constantly trying to work. He has this inner turmoil that his stories aren't good enough. And you know what? The dude is being shady. I feel like he's a cheating ass hoe, but that could just be a bias of mine. They make it to the top and they realize that there's nothing up there. No Bob, nothing. Just the cottage and the chapel and snow. So much snow. They can't even see their own car in front of the chapel because it's buried under all of the snow. And as they start heading back down the hill, They're slipping, falling, and the chapel looks so far away. And Amelia says, oh my God, I see someone heading towards the chapel. And Adam sees it too. Adam reaches into his pocket and he's like, oh, thank God I still have the key. It's locked. But the relief is gone when he notices that whoever is at the front has their own key. And now they're entering, wearing what looks to be a red kimono just like what his mom used to wear when she invited and he tries to delete the memories. But he's certain that someone just walked into the chapel. Even if they ran down, it's still another 20 minutes. I mean, who knows what the person would have done by then or gone in that time. Amelia, how did you get this place? I already told you, I won it in the staff Christmas raffle. And you got an email? Yes. From who? The housekeeper, I already told you. Did anyone else know at work or did they win something similar? Well, Nina got a box of chocolates, but she bought like 20 raffle tickets, so she was bound to win something. And how many raffle tickets did you buy? Just one. I mean, we already know who's in the chapel. It's Robin, and she probably has 30 minutes to do what she has to do before the couple gets back. Should be more than enough. They think that she's the housekeeper, which is funny. (laughs) The chapel already has their smell, and she hates it. The smell of the dog, the strong perfume that the woman used to wear, it's overpowering. Robin goes in and pours out all their shampoo down the sink, washes the toilet with their pink and blue toothbrushes, steals Amelia's face cream, and takes all of Adam's credit cards and his wallet, and she finds an origami crane. Cranes are good luck, no? He's a superstitious guy. Hmm. Interesting. There's an inhaler on the side of the drawer, and she takes a puff. Not great, but whatever. She pumps the rest of it out into the air and takes along the empty container with her. She also takes the sleeping prescription pills. It is time to finish what they started. Meanwhile, Adam and Amelia are sprinting to the chapel. The snow is falling down so fast they can barely see what's in front of them. And when they get to the chapel, Amelia spots a pair of boots at the front. Boots that were never there before. And someone drew several smiley faces on the dust of the wooden church bench. Amelia starts yelling for Adam who got there first, and she finds him in the lounge. Well, not really. She finds him in this new room that she's never seen before. The secret room of the lounge. It's a creepy room. The type that makes you feel like you've fallen down the rabbit hole or you're trapped in one of those alternate realities. Adam is sitting at an antique desk. Whoever came when we were walking down, they're long gone. I searched the whole place, Amelia. The only change I noticed is the door to the secret room was open. I don't get it. I think I do. I recognize this room. I've seen it before. I've seen a picture of this study in a magazine a few years ago, and I remember who it was about. You didn't win this in a raffle. It's all too much of a coincidence. I know who this property belongs to. The eighth letter, seventh anniversary. Dear Adam, it's been a rough year. October O'Brien was found dead in her London hotel a few months ago. You were one of the last people to see her alive. It was a suspected suicide. It's obviously devastating. She always seems so happy. No one would have guessed what she would have done, that she would have done that thing. Barely 30 years old and, of course, your dreams of seeing rock, paper, scissors coming to the screen has been canceled. I know you miss her. I miss her too. And for our anniversary this year, you suggested we go to New York City, and I liked it. Until I realized it was the premiere of Henry Winter's latest film. You were honored because Henry Winter said that he would only go to his premiere if you were there. You thought maybe it's because he loved your work, but that's not why he invited you. And that's not why he suggested you bring your wife. You haven't been yourself recently, Adam. You've been grieving October, I get it. She was more than a colleague. She was going to bring your dream to life, and I'm sure it's upsetting, but I can't help but feel like there's something else you're not telling me. You spent our whole anniversary exploring New York City with Henry Winter, and I spent it alone going to the Statue of Liberty. It's not that great in person. And I couldn't stop thinking about the seven-year itch. I'm sure you have it too, but just know whatever happens, I won't be the first to scratch it. 
At the Statue of Liberty, I got you our anniversary gift. Copper. A little smiley-faced penny. It was a copper penny with a smiley face punched into it. My coworkers started texting me about my day while I was out, and they were being a little too friendly, but it does make me feel a little bit less lonely, if I'm being honest. And at dinner for our anniversary, you told me that Henry Winters wants you to join him in L.A. And I just... I lost it, you know? I've been having a rough couple of years, and here you are leaving again, and during dinner, with a little too much wine in your system, you said, you know, you wouldn't worry so much about my career if you cared more about your own. I love taking care of dogs. They're abandoned, and sometimes I feel abandoned by you, by everyone. Yeah, well, Adam, I'm sure I could write something just as good as you or Henry Winter, for that matter. You leaned back and you smirked. Yeah, everyone thinks they can write till they sit down and try to do it. Well, I care more about the real world than indulging in these stupid fantasies. Hey, indulging in my fantasies paid for our house. Adam, do you miss your dad or something? What? It's so random. Is that why you're treating Henry Winter as some sort of surrogate dad? It's like an obsession. You've abandoned your whole life to work on his work. And now all you do is seek his approval and it's needy at best and worst narcissistic. It's so obvious to him and everyone else around him how desperate you are for him to endorse you, approve of you. Henry Winter is not your friend. The two fought the whole dinner, and when they left, she didn't break the silence to him to let him know that Henry was sitting a few tables away from them and had been watching them and listening the whole time. What? And back at the hotel, she couldn't help but text her new work friend with a picture of the Statue of Liberty, and they texted back with a thumbs up and a kiss. Amelia was practically screaming, Who the hell does the chapel belong to? Henry Winter. And she freezes. Amelia had always been afraid of him, not because of the books he writes, I mean, yeah, that too, but his eyes, they were always too blue and too piercing, almost as if he can look inside a person, not just look at them, but see things that he shouldn't be able to. So Amelia starts hyperventilating, and she brushes Adam off because they can't find her inhaler. How do you know it's his house? Well, there's only like two pictures of him online, right? And one of them was in his study, and it's this desk. But it was inside of his London house. The desk used to belong to Agatha Christie, I remember, when I went to his London house. It, was, it has wheels and so many drawers. Henry paid a small fortune for it. He felt like he couldn't write anywhere but here. Are you sure it's this desk? And look around. The lounge is different, but look inside this room, this hidden study. All the books are written by Henry Winters, just in hundreds of different languages, special editions, limited editions. It's all Henry Winter. I mean, what is this, a bad joke, a prank? Why would he do this? And why did he take Bob? Maybe he's upset that I didn't want to adapt any more of his books. You what? You didn't tell me that. I just decided that maybe it was time to focus on my own work. And I didn't want to hear that I told you so as if I told you, so I tried to keep it friendly, but he refused to talk to me after that. And Amelia tries to focus, but her breathing is getting escalated. <laughs> is that my inhaler behind you? Why do you have my inhaler? Just give it to me. And she slips it in her pocket. Let's find Bob and just get out of here. And then they hear a bark. <gasps> it's from outside. Bob. So they run out of the chapel towards the bark. And, you know, they're treading through the snow now. And they stop dead in their tracks. Because someone in front of them is wearing a tweed jacket in the freezing snow. Henry? Henry? And they carefully walk around to face him and they realize it's a snowman in Henry Winter's clothes. And right next to him is a gravestone, a headstone. Unlike the other ones, this one looks new. It doesn't look centuries old. And someone has wiped the snow off of all of it, deliberately. The other ones were snowed in. There's a red leather collar sitting on the top. It has the name tag, Bob. I don't get it. Why take off his collar and put it here? But Adam is too busy to respond. The headstone says, Henry Winter, father of one, author of many, 1937 to 2018. Wait, what? It doesn't make sense. How on earth did Henry die two years ago? Wouldn't we have known about it? I mean, sure, he's a private guy, but this is one of the most famous authors in the entire freaking world. And you worked with him. I mean, it makes sense. Henry always had a thing with black things, black house, black, black pond, black water chapel. Meanwhile, it looks like he's going to cry because at the end of the day, Henry Winter was his idol. Wait, but the headstone said that he died two years ago, and dead people can't write novels and send them to their agents to be published. Henry Winter had a, a, a novel that was just published, and his agent was wondering if I wanted to adapt it, and I said no. Well, maybe it was someone in the family that sent it. Maybe it was like an old manuscript he had. I mean, he was born in 1937, so that must mean he must have some family, right? He's no spring chicken. How did you know he was born in 1937? I, I just read it on the, on the headstone. 
And Amelia Earhart went missing in 1937 and I was named after her. Names are important. Henry Winter didn't have any children. That's not what his headstone said. Now Adam looks more confused and distraught than ever. He suggests that they get out of here before it's too late. But there's four major problems. Bob is still gone, the car is snowed in, and two, not one, but two of the tires are slashed. They're flat. Meanwhile, Robin goes back to the cottage to be with her new house guest, Bob. He wags his tail and licks her face. Very friendly dog, the kind that trusts everyone. Even Oscar the rabbit has warmed up to their new house guest. And now the visitors should know that the chapel belonged to Henry Winter, and they should also know that he's dead. She wished she could have seen their faces when they found out. Robin remembers when she found out Henry Winter was dying. It was over the phone. He called her. He just said, I need you. He didn't have to say why, where, or how. They both knew he was sick and dying. He sold his London flat by then, and he was living in his Scottish hideaway full time. A hermit, really. Robin was shocked that she was the one that he called in his hour of need. He aged not well. No greeting, no hug, no thanks. But for the first time ever, he invited her into his study. I mean, she'd seen it before, often, but it was the first time he ever invited her inside. The wallpaper were all rabbits. Every surface covered in rabbit wooden sculptures, resin rabbits, and then in the corner was a cage with a rabbit. You have a rabbit? More of a companion, really. I'm fond of white rabbits. Yeah, I noticed. Does it have a name? Robin. I call her Robin. Why? She reminds me of you. Anyway, I don't know how much time we have, so let's not waste it. I wanted to show you where my will is. I have all my plans written down. I want to be cremated, and everything else you need to know is in the folder. I'm halfway through the last novel. I don't think I'll be able to finish it. My agent will look over everything else book-related, but other literary estate things I would... I'd rather you do. And then Henry pulled out an article of his newest release that was a hit number one on New York Times bestseller list, and he was so happy with himself. And Robin watched as he took out his laptop and started giving Robin all the passwords. Everything. The password was Robin. She didn't know what to say, so she said nothing. And then he asked her to grab champagne in the crypt so that they could celebrate one last time. And down in the crypt, she couldn't help but think about all the stories that Henry wrote about this place to make sure that none of the locals came around. The wooden statues of creepy animals with strange eyes didn't help either. Henry loved carving those. It's like carving fiction. And when Robin got back into the study with the bottle, Henry was peaceful. He was dead. At least he was happy that his book was a number one bestseller. Again. That night, Robin buried Henry along with his favorite books. He wanted to be cremated, but since they had a graveyard right outside, this was more convenient. But that wasn't the only request that she ignored. She denied him his request to tell everyone that he died. The reason wasn't shady per se. It's not like she wanted his money, which he left her like all of it. She just never used it on herself. She just used the money to take care of the place and buy a headstone out and redecorate the bedroom for the visitors. But that wasn't for her, it was for them. And that day, Robin started going through Henry's work and she read his latest novel out of curiosity and she realized that a lot of it was really good but it could be better. And for the next few weeks, she wrote the rest of the book. She adopted the rabbit as her own. The ninth letter, eighth anniversary. Dear Adam, we didn't celebrate our anniversary this year. I've been spending more time with my friend from work and you're struggling with the latest adaptation of Henry Winter's book. I think you're trying too hard to please him instead of doing what makes sense to you. I offered to help and you didn't like it. I've been thinking about leaving you recently my friend from work is caring and genuinely interested in me and they never make me feel stupid or take me for granted. Face blindness is not the only way that you make me feel invisible. Sometimes I wonder if the only reason I stay is for Bob and the house. I love this house. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into every single inch of this place. When we were younger, I never imagined we would live in a place like this. You probably did though, because your dreams are always bigger than mine. But then again, so are your nightmares. Our anniversary wasn't great because you invited him. I came home one day to find you and Henry Winter drinking in the kitchen. I looked horrified. I don't know if you knew, because you can't read my face, but Henry Winter sure did. He explained that his London flat was sold and he was in town, and if it wasn't such a burden, if he could stay. Those blue eyes were staring into my soul, and they made me feel so uncomfortable. So for the rest of the weekend, I spent it with my work friend. We went to an art gallery, hung out. She likes animals more than people too, which is why she started volunteering at work. That's how we met. 
She makes me feel special. Not like I'm second best, which is what you do. She also likes tin food for lunch. I've never seen her eat anything green or anything a salad, but everyone has their vices. When I got back, you didn't even ask who I was staying with or what I was doing. You were just so happy to be around Henry Winters all weekend. And as an anniversary present, you gave me a bronze compass and it was inscribed. So you can always find your way back to me. I didn't realize that you thought I was lost. The couple ends up giving up their plans. Hold on. I gotta focus. They look like little cheese. Yeah, that's the idea. Wow. They give up on their plans to leave. I mean, their car is not even gonna get started. Nothing is gonna happen. They're going nowhere. And the husband, he says, Amelia, if you have any idea what's really going on right now, now's a good time to tell me. And she says, don't you start with me. This place belongs to the author whose novels you've spent the last 10 years of your life adapting. I never liked him or his books and everything I've seen this weekend suggests that you're the reason that we're trapped here. So the two head back into the study where Adam pulls out one of the desk drawers in the desk and there are 10 tiny drawers. He opens one, a small bronze rabbit statue pops out. He says, wait, I've seen this before. Then he opens another origami cranes, the whole thing origami cranes. The whole drawer? Is filled with origami cranes, just like the ones that he carries around in his wallet. All the color drains from his face and he looks up at Amelia. The next one, copper pennies with smiley faces carved onto them. Then another, an antique looking iron key. 10th letter, 9th anniversary. Dear Adam, our house doesn't really feel like a home anymore. <laughs> You're busy and um, we try to enjoy this anniversary watching TV. You know, we act like that's what we like to do. We like to spend our time watching TV together, enjoying each other's company. But in all honesty, the TV is because we have nothing to talk about anymore. We like to convince ourselves but it, that it's fun, but it's just lonely. It's mainly because we have nothing to talk about anymore. And almost like an answer to our prayer, the door rang on our anniversary. It's my friend from work. She was crying, upset. She was in heels in this tight little red dress. And she said that she was supposed to go on a date and he met her. He said he was gonna pick her up at her place, but he tried to force himself into the apartment. He threatened her if they didn't do it, and she ran out, and we're the only people that she knows in London. So here she is. It's weird not seeing her at work. It's weird seeing her all dressed up with makeup on. So we're gonna go ahead and bake this for a 400 degree for 20 minutes. Tears were streaming down her face. She works at the dog shelter with me now. I got her a full-time position, but I noticed that today her hair was different. What used to be brown curly hair was now blonde and straight, and it was strange. She said, I'm sorry to turn up like this uninvited. What, what, what happened? Are you okay? Come in. And no, no, it just, Adam told me it's your anniversary and no, it's okay. Don't worry. We've been married for almost like a decade. We don't even have sex anymore. Yikes. Why did she just say that? Okay, it was strange. And she said, well, I got my hair done. I see. <laughs> and, and now, in hindsight, it was weird. She looked different, yet familiar. She... She looked... She looked... I don't know. And the friend from work said, I just wanted to look nice because I had a date, but it was, it was bad. He wanted to pick me up, and I thought he was just old-fashioned, but he was determined to get inside my apartment, and he threatened me, and he said that he knows where I live now, and I didn't know where else to go. I don't know anybody else in town, so I came here. And Adam, way too excited, said, It's okay, you're safe now. Would you like a glass of champagne? I noticed you said it too excitedly. You're always a better husband when we have an audience. And so that was our anniversary. Sitting there, listening to her talk about the horrors of being single and how horrible single men are. And the whole time, I couldn't help but notice how beautiful she was when she made an effort. She slept over that night and we went to our room to whisper. So what did you think of her? She's nice, but she kind of reminds me of an actress. I've met enough of them to know. What? That's bonkers. She's a quiet little timid mouse. Not all actresses are on the stage. Some walk around us, masquerading as normal people. We made love for the first time in a long time that night. I think it helped to put things into perspective, you know? The fact that she was miserable and we had each other at least. I never want to end up like my work friend. The single life seemed broken. 
So now, back to the chapel. Adam is confused, and he's staring in the desk drawers, and he suffers from face blindness, but he has no other memory problems, okay? He knows the desk is full of anniversary gifts his wife has given him over the years. So he spins to Amelia, and he's like, are you in on this? You arranged this little trip to Scotland. You drove us here. Explain this. What? I can't explain anything that happened this weekend. Can't or you won't. Did you already know that Henry Winters was dead? I think you need to calm down. I didn't know anything, and I still don't, except that Henry delivered a new book in September. So how do we even know that he died? What if someone else wrote it, or what if that gravestone is fake? Adam thought it was ridiculous. The book sold over the world. Henry's armies of fans would have noticed if someone else wrote it. Are you kidding? It's Henry Winters. But sure enough, the math doesn't add up. And he would have been dead by the time that his book was out. What? Adam can't help feel like his wife isn't on this. He will always feel guilty about cheating on his wife, but like he said, St. Amelia slept with someone she shouldn't have too. But it seems like she conveniently forgets that part of the story. Adam feels like a haunted marriage is just as scary as a haunted house. So he reaches for her hand and drags her to the staircase. Do you know any of these people in these pictures? Tell me right now. Do you know any of them? Amelia's confused. She's a great liar, but her asthma gives her away. She starts breathing hard. What? I don't know any of these people. You're scaring me, Adam. This isn't... I didn't do any of this. Wait. That one kind of looks like... It's those blue eyes. It looks like Henry as a teenager, I think. And this one, they look just like him. Maybe these are his parents? K keep looking. I I'm so confused. I don't understand. These three pictures weren't here before, remember? It used to just be nails. Someone put the pictures back here. And before Amelia finishes, Adam spots one of the hallway doors is open. Remember one of the locked rooms? And he runs up the rest of the stairs and he goes in. It's a child's bedroom. Everything is dusty. It smells moldy like nobody has opened the door in months. But more alarmingly, in the middle of the room is a dollhouse that looks remarkably like their house in London. Adam is so busy being creeped out by that. Meanwhile, Amelia is behind him and says, have you seen this? It's a jack-in-the-box. It's oh. similar, a jack-in-the-box, you crank it and the, it pops out. Oh my god. He used to grow up with jack-in-the-boxes and he hated it. And this one, instead of jack-in-the-box, it said Adam in the box. He used to call it the box devil. It reminds him of the night that his mother flew up in the car. The two of them scan the rest of the room. The wallpaper, the curtains, the duvet, they're all covered in faded images of the same thing. Robins. And in the corner of the room, there were faded chalkboard words. I must not tell tales. I must not tell tales. I must not tell tales. 11th letter, 10th anniversary. Dear Adam, it's not really our 10th anniversary because of what happened. I thought things were getting better between us, and I guess not. I feel stupid for, now I know the truth. For a while, I thought I was being watched. Everywhere we went, it felt like someone was watching us, but it didn't matter. I was so excited to spend the weekend with you. I got off work early. Came home hoping to find you in your study, but you had a surprise for me too. You were still in bed with my friend from work. She called in sick that morning and now I knew why. Everything stopped when I walked into the room. I don't just mean you and her. I couldn't process what I was seeing, but I will never forget the fact that she smiled at me. I remember you look frantically looking at her and then me and then you tried your best lie. You said, I thought it was you. I wish in that moment I did something clever, but instead I went out to that front lawn, I got a shovel and dug out that bloody ugly magnolia tree that was once our perfect front lawn. The friend from work ran away. You watched in horror. The tree was bigger than me now, but I dragged it all the way up the stairs, scratching the walls, leaving dirt trailing behind, and I threw it in the bed that we once shared, the bed that you propped my work friend into. You begged me to stay. I packed a bag, and I don't think anything can fix us now, do you? Amelia realizes Adam still hasn't put the pieces of the puzzle together. But Amelia is smart. She grabs his hand and leads him back to the pictures near the staircase. Look at this picture, Adam, this picture. It's Henry in the background, and it's you. You're in this picture. We both know that you didn't invite him, but the fact that he's standing outside the courthouse, he put this with his family pictures. It suggests that Henry Winters thought of you as more than a screenwriter. What? I don't get it. Adam, it's the photo from your wedding. And the woman in the wedding photo isn't me. What? What do you mean? It's from your first wedding, when you married Robin. I, I don't understand. I think you do. 
I think even though you were married to Robin for 10 years, she never told you that she was Henry Winter's daughter. I think she grew up here and that little girl's room is hers. And I know you can't see it, but these three photos were missing yesterday and now they're here and it's all of your ex fucking wife. Adam is so confused. Henry, Henry Winters didn't have children. Robin never wanted to talk about her family, especially her father. They were estranged. I know you can't see it for yourself, but you have to trust me. But how would Adam ever trust her? Amelia was the one that seduced her best friend's husband. There were better people to trust. Robin was different, okay? Robin was genuine and good and honest, and Adam couldn't imagine her lying about something big, something like this. So it just didn't make sense. But then again, Henry Winters reached out to him. Robin always believed in him, unlike Amelia. She never wanted anything in return. She just wanted him to be happy. Meanwhile, Amelia doesn't think Robin is so great. In fact, Amelia starts accusing Robin of killing Henry and maybe even October O'Brien out of jealousy. Adam starts defending her. No, when you were at Battersea, the dog shelter, she was kind to you, she trusted you, she got you a job there. This isn't about me right now. For those 10 years that you were married to Robin, you were Henry Winter's son-in-law and you just didn't even know it. Bob, oh my God, at least thank God Bob is fine. He was Robin's dog. She adopted him, loves him like a child. If she has him, at least we know that Bob is safe. But why would she invite us here this weekend? Like, what is so special about this weekend? Amelia checks her phone. Saturday the 29th, February? It's a leap year. Oh my god. It's our wedding anniversary. What? No, not ours. It's the date that I married Robin. Are you getting it? Robin wrote those letters. The oh work friend? Oh my god. The work friend is Amelia. Wait. That he cheated on Robin with? He's cheating with? right now? He's not cheating right now. They got a divorce. Okay, hold on. So Robin remembers walking out the day that she saw them together, Amelia and Adam. She managed to leave the- Wait, 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 can you slow down a bit? Like, yeah. Hold on, let me process this for a sec. So all the letters were written by Robin. Yes. That's 10 year anniversary. Yes. Okay. And they divorced. Now he's married to- To the Amelia. Work, the pretty work friend. Yeah. But they also hate each other. Yeah. So Robin remembers walking out that day. She saw Amelia and Adam together. She managed to leave the sapphire engagement ring on the table. It was special to Adam. She took her letters that she wrote him and a few of her favorite things. Her biggest regret was leaving Bob behind. She'd always regret it. And that's when Henry called to tell her that he was dying and asked her to come home. She was shocked. She hadn't heard from her father in years. But she had nowhere to go. She couldn't even go to work. Amelia was there now, taking over her life. She helped Amelia get a job and a life, and this woman in return became her friend, and now she's Adam's new wife with her new blonde hair that looked exactly like Robin's fancy clothes. <laughs> but more than Amelia, Robin blamed Adam. Well, not anymore. She blames them both. Robin's life had three turning points. When she stopped trying to have a child of her own, when her husband cheated on her, and when her mom drowned in a clawfoot bathtub. Everyone thought it was an accident, but Robin knew better. She always believed her father was different. Her father tried to get every, rid of every trace of their mom after her death and even tossed Robin to the side so he could focus on his writing, his, his one true baby. He thought he could just buy his way with Robin. And he was wrong. That's why she never took a penny from him, even as an adult. She would rather sleep in the freezing cold cottage. His money felt like blood money. Why? Henry even wrote about a man who killed his wife in the tub a few years after Robin's mom died. It was called Drowning Your Sorrows, and it made Robin question everything. Maybe the stuff he writes about is so good because it's not fiction. Robin was inspired to write a story of her own. Her boarding school teacher was so impressed that they sent it to Henry Winters. And when Robin came home for Christmas break, he was so furious, he made her write lines of punishment for writing stories at school. I must not tell tales. I must not tell tales. That Christmas break, Robin found her dolls drowning in the sink, and someone had cut her hair in her sleep. Her mother's scissors were at the bedside table. That was when she felt like, maybe her dad didn't just write about monsters. Maybe he was one. So Robin never wrote another word of fiction again. Until her dad died. And then she finished his book. She deleted most of what he wrote, it wasn't that good. Replaced it with stories of her own. Sent it to Henry's agent, pretending to be Henry. And the agent said, Finish your novel, it's your best yet. And Robin sat there and cried with her new rabbit that she renamed Oscar. Robin was her name. She was proud, but she could never tell the world that Henry's bestseller was really hers. 
12th letter, 11th anniversary. Or at least what would have been. This is one year before she invites Amelia and Adam to the chapel. Dear Adam, I still write these letters and I read all the old ones recently and even though we're divorced, we had a lot more good times than bad. I miss you. Sorry for all the lies. I grew up surrounded by fiction and books and it's hard to not keep secrets when your father is a world famous author. My mom was a writer too, but I never told you about her. I couldn't. When we first met, I wanted you to get your start in the world, and I, I believed in you, and having not spoken to my dad in years, I reached out to ask him to let you adapt one of his novels. It was supposed to be a one-done deal, but he used you to get close to me. He was always holding it over my head, and you just were so desperate for another one and another one. But now I'm free. I miss Bob. I wish you were here next to me. And I always wonder, you promised to love me forever. But I wonder if you ever still even think of me or miss me. It's hard to picture Amelia in our house, sleeping in my bed with my husband, walking my dog, working in my office, and I still can't believe you gave her that sapphire engagement ring. Or that she would even want to wear something that once was your mother's. Or mine. But stealing things seems to be a habit of hers. I wrote a novel, and I'm writing another one called Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's all about choices. I've made mine, and the time will come for you to make yours. Now, in present time, Amelia wants to clear the air. She said, everyone thinks the second wife is a bitch and the first wife is a victim. But 10 years is a long time to be married to someone, and Robin was the type that let people walk all over her. Her husband walked over her, her parents, her, her friends, even me. She's the loneliest woman I've ever f met. Of course I felt guilty sleeping with her husband, but their relationship was long over before I came into the picture. Besides, we're married now. And instead of all of us being miserable, and she was constantly unhappy, constantly complaining to me about how Adam only cares about work. But I support him. I worked out more than she did. My body was in better shape. Our sex life was great. And I was genuinely fascinated by all his talks. He always had something so intriguing to say. His opinions were important to me. He loved to talk and I loved to listen. Sure, I don't love reading that much, but that's fine. I knew I could make him happier than she did. And two out of three happy endings is better than none. It's not like Robin put up a fight. She moved out, divorced him, and I moved in. And we were happy, and we still are. I'm hoping this, me this weekend is making me realize that we're fine. And being around Robin, his crazy ex-wife, is only going to bring us closer together. So the couple decides that they're going to leave. And before they do, they enter Henry's old room, filled with wooden carved statues of Robins. And then on the bed, a red kimono. That's strange. Why would Robin put that there? Either way, they need to leave. And even if they have to walk to town, they got to do it. And then they look up to the mirror, and in red lipstick, there were the words, rock, paper, scissors. 13th letter, 12th anniversary, current time. Dear Adam, this is the first of these letters I'm going to let you read, and it feels good being honest. I never stopped loving you, even when I hated you. You must know now that Henry Winter was my father. He was always lurking in the background, even on our wedding day. You just never recognized his face, like you don't mind. I had a complicated relationship with him, and I just wanted him to love me. When I was 18, I changed my name to my mother's maiden name, and I never came back to the chapel until I visited my dad when he was dying. I wrote a book under Henry's name, Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's a book about a couple who have been married for 10 years who exchange traditional gifts, paper, copper, tin, and each year the wife writes the husband a letter that she never lets him read. But when their relationship is in trouble and sometimes a weekend getaway is what needs to get them back on track, right? Sound familiar? It's a combination of your book and my letters to you and what's happening now. If you like it, Henry will send it to his agent and he will include a letter saying he wants you to start adapting it right away. You'll finally get your own story on screen. But if you don't, and you have to end it with Amelia, this is our chance to start fresh, live a new life, the one we've always dreamed of. Besides, Henry hired a PI, and that PI knew that you were having an affair long before I did. The PI's name is Samuel Smith, and thanks to my father, well, he thinks he's still alive, but he found out that there's a lot that you don't know about Amelia. It was no coincidence that Amelia befriended me. You were always part of her plan. Did you know that you met Amelia more than 30 years ago? You just couldn't recognize her face. Amelia Jones was lying to you since the moment she met you. And she lied to me too. Ask her yourself. You guys used to live very close by. Amelia had a record of shoplifting and stealing cars. And the police at one point questioned her about a hit and run. She was 13. Her foster mom came up with an alibi and the cops let her go. 
the car that they caught her in was the car that killed your mom. The only witness, you, couldn't pick her out. But she knew you. She remembered you. Maybe this is her sick way of trying to get you to forgive her. Maybe she wants to fix you. But don't you ever wonder why she writes down all, her night all your nightmares? Do you think it's try to help you remember who killed your mom? Or make sure you never do? Do you still love her now? Do you really ever trust her? The answer is up to you. Meanwhile, the couple are upstairs when they hear this big bang downstairs. They run to the wooden chapel doors and they try to open it, but it's locked. They've been locked in now. And Amelia is pissed, okay? She's like, your crazy ex-wife is fucking batshit crazy. Why would she steal our dog? It's ready. Yes. Ten seconds later. Oh. <gasps> Just like that. Just like that. That's my fault. I know. <laughs> you think I don't know? Let's eat it, yeah? Okay. Let's take a bite. Here's a fork for you. Gooey. It's so, well, it's like a custard. It tastes like milk. I don't like it. It's not sweet enough. But it's yummy. We'll like right. what the Asians say. So good, not too sweet. Yeah. This is shit your sister would be like, good dessert! <laughs> and like, it, it tastes cheesy. <laughs> Alright, that's great. Now, um, we got some cleanup to do, yeah? Mm -hmm. Alright, we'll be right back. Yeah, be. And Adam is like, well, technically it's her dog. <laughs> yeah, but that was before she left. She disappeared, you never heard from her again, ex except through a freaking attorney. Yeah, well, can you blame her? Your marriage was long over before I came along, okay? And you might want to hang out reminiscing about your lovely first wife, but I think she's full-on turned into a psycho and we should leave. She probably tried to freeze us to death. I bet she was the one in the stupid cottage. You might be scared of your ex-wife Robin, but I'm not. Let's go have a word with her. And boom, the noise downstairs from the chapel doors. They're locked in and a letter is slipped through. It's addressed to Adam. He snatches it before Amelia can and he's running away from her so he can read it. It's from Robin. He skims through it without Amelia seeing, remember the first letter she's gonna let him read? The how well do you know your wife? No coincidence, your paths crossed more than 30 years ago, the hit and run. Adam knew the affair was a mistake from the get-go. Robin was his everything. Maybe it was a midlife crisis and Amelia made him feel good. She made him feel like the sun was shining out of his ass. It was his ego that had the affair and he was, he was too pathetic to say no. He ruined everything. It should have never happened, but somehow Amelia moved in and took over life. I mean, even found the sapphire engagement ring and begged and begged and wouldn't shut up about it. And you know what? It never even fit her perfectly. It was always too tight. And she always squeezed it around her grubby little finger. And now he knew the truth. He looked up. Did you used to live in the same area as me? Did we go to the same school growing up? Amelia looks sick to her stomach. She doesn't answer, but they both know. Did you used to steal cars? Did you get arrested for dangerous driving when we were both 13? Amelia starts hyperventilating and starts twisting at her engagement ring. Did you go for a joyride in the rain one night? Please, let's just talk. Did you crash into the woman wearing a red kimono walking her dog? Did you leave her for dead and drive away? Adam, please. Did you think you could get away with it forever? Amelia starts shoving her inhaler, and inhaler into her mouth, but it's empty and she whispers, help, please, I love you. And I'm not the only one that lied. I'm so sorry, I only ever, Wanted to make you happy. Well, you didn't. You never made me happy and I was never happy with you. Amelia's eyes darken and she reaches for the knife on the kitchen counter, but then another face appears and a flash of extremely sharp metal flashes before Adam's eyes. Sharp scissors. Six months later, another letter. Dear Adam, it's not our wedding anniversary, but I wanted to write you a letter. We're a family again, you, me, Bob, and Oscar. Nobody, Nobody needs, needs to know, know what happened, happened in Scotland. Scotland. It was hard at first to find so many traces of her in our home, but nothing a few trash bags couldn't fix. Everything is back to normal. Well, I don't have my job, but that's okay. I'm a full-time writer now. Not that anyone knows. They all think it's Henry. <laughs> Rock, Paper, Scissors is going to be published next year. Nobody needs to know that Henry Winters was my father or that he's dead or what happened to your second wife. It still upsets me that she was your wife at all. I tried to take the ring off of her finger. It doesn't belong to her but it refused to come off her lifeless hand. Even in death, some people are stubborn. Marriage is hard work, but it hasn't been perfect. At least we cherish what we have now. We have secrets, just none from each other. But it's not just Robin that's happy. Adam is happy too. I mean, most of the time. 
Turns out Robin is just as good as writing thriller stories as her dad was, so everything is great. Sure, all the screenplays he's doing are Robin and his work, but they have Henry's name, but that's not the point. The nightmares have stopped completely. But he'll always still blame himself. I still think about that day, you know? The guilt will never go away. I was so angry with my mom, just inviting another friend over, painting her face, spraying her perfume, wrapping herself up in a red kimono as if she's a little present to be unwrapped. So that night, I went out to the park, met a girl my age, and we sat there talking. We shouldn't have, but it was the first time I drank and I smoked. First time I kissed a girl. Then she asked me if I wanted to ride in her stolen car. It was fun. I remember the rain sounds, the sound of her laughter, and she kept yelling, faster and faster. And I turned a corner, and I saw my mom. She saw me. It all happened so fast, the screeching of the brakes, the red kimono flying up in the air, her body hitting the windscreen, the, the wheels rolling over the dog, and I was frozen. The girl freaked out, and she pushed me out the driver's seat, climbed into the driver's side, and drove off. Later, neighbors came out to see me leaning over my mom's dead body. They assumed we went on a walk together and someone had hit her. I didn't even know the girl's name. I would never recognize her face. Honestly, I never thought I'd see her again. So it was a shock to discover we were married. Do I feel bad about what happened to Amelia? No. People die every day, even the good ones. And she wasn't a good one. Anyway, just excited to put this all behind me. Can finally rest now. And then the book ends with the PI that Henry hired. As a PI, of course he feels a little sus that Henry hasn't called him in a while, and he only talks via email now. He doesn't even sound the same on email. He easily finds Henry's Blackwater Chapel address and goes to investigate. Then he thinks about Robin. You know, the PI has been watching Robin for decades now. Really saw her grow into her own. For Henry, Robin was always a difficult child. She had a hard time separating fact and fiction. She was always making up her own stories. She made up stories about witches being held in the crypt in the basement. And whenever Henry tried to discipline her, she would cut off her own hair at night and leave the ends on his pillow for him. Henry was rough on himself. He felt like he was a bad father, just working all the time, but the grief of losing her mom was too much. Henry hated the screen adaptations of his novels, his babies, but he did it for his other child, Robin. He only wanted the PI to follow Robin, not to get updates or snoop or be a creep. He just wanted to know, is my daughter happy? That's it. Okay, the ending, you have to go read the book because the words that they use are insane, but essentially, what I think is going on is Amelia is not the most innocent person per se, right? But she wasn't the one driving that killed Adam's mom. In fact, Adam was the one driving. So that's a huge coincidence. Now, Robin was the first wife. She's the one that wrote the letter. She's also Henry Winters' daughter. Now, it seemed like Henry Winters was this crazy, twisted fiction writer, but this ending makes it seem like none of them are who they say they are still. So Adam still has a secret from his wife, which is he killed his own mom. And then with, you know, Robin, it's this open-ended of, how do we know how much of what she said is true? Yeah, so it sounds like she is the crazy writer. Yeah, that makes up a lot of stuff. And that's why she's so good at writing. I like it because I hate books where in the end you're like, oh, is this all a dream? Was this all fake? I hate yeah. those because it's so cheap. But this one is just enough doubt to be like, I know what I read is true, but how much of it is twisted? How much of it is a little bit bent? So good, no? Yeah, it's, wow. The, yes, yeah. and then you have to go read the book because there are so many like little nuggets that you find throughout the book and then in the end you're like, wait a freaking minute, are you freaking kidding me right now? Even the way that the letters are done, I, I was not expecting that twist at all. Yeah, no. And like a twist this big, come on, you usually start expecting it. Yeah. But it was so good. I love wow. Alice Feeney. I cannot wait to finish her um, Dar Daisy Darker on Audible. But make sure to check out all of her books because I think I'm her number one stan now. <laughs> and leave your comments. What do you think about this book? Did you read it? What are your thoughts? Do you have any lingering questions? So, yes. oh, side note, I don't think Adam ever went to the chapel. Yeah. I think uh, he just knew the steps by, you know, he just knows. He's a creepy dude. But so good. The drawers, when yes. they open, there's all the anniversary gifts. What does that? Why is there so many anniversary gifts? It's just Robin, like, reminding him. Like, leaving these little nuggets of, like, remember how happy we were? 
do you remember mm-hmm. our anniversaries? Do you think about me? Uh, and he assumed it was his second wife because it's like she tried to throw the crane into the fire, remember? And in the beginning, you think it's because she's like, you live in the past. But she's probably upset because that's from his ex-wife. Uh, and he thinks it's her because maybe it's like her taunting. Like, oh, you miss your ex-wife or some shit? Like, uh, so that's why it's like, is this you? Did you do this? Okay. Got it. Interesting, right? And the reason that even Bob is growling and scratching at the door is probably because he smells Robin, his owner, Uh, and wants to get out and be with Robin. Insane. I don't even know what to say. But I hope you guys enjoyed this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode, and I will see you guys next Monday. Bye!